Hello, you're listening to a Talk of Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined here with Chris, as Yo. always. Yo. I, sorry, I should have done the before part. I know I messed you up there. You go go ahead. Yo. There you go. It would be it would be unnormal if people couldn't fully clearly hear you say that. But anyways, <laughs> we're from TalkingSpirit.com, so we can go for our links, social media links, all that good stuff. But yes, today's episode is our summer 2023 anime season. First impressions, part one of who knows. We always go, we just go on a whim. We don't like to rush through them and try to get certain amounts in each episode. We'll just, so we'll just kind of wing it and whatever comes, comes. If, we, if it's two episodes, it's fine. If it's three episodes, we'll see. But um, yeah, most of the shows have gotten like at least three episodes. There's like five shows or so that have like three episodes. The rest are like four and five episodes. I think one's six now. I, I, would, I would assume Yohani, I think, is probably six. That was like the first show to start, but you were getting into the season. So it's time it's time to really kind of give our ideas of what we think of each of the episodes. We'll go through each show, give our, you know, a synopsis of what kind of happens at the beginning part. So spoilers for the first few episodes. I know that's that bothers some people, which I mean, I understand. But if you want impressions, you, you got to know at least what you're <laughs> getting into. So <laughs> we'll, we'll just start with each one of them and say the, the name of the show. But we can't say the whole name because like with Yohane, the Parhelion, sorry, spoilers, Sunshine in the Mirror. You know, she's a Parhelion, apparently. So that's a spoiler. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we'll give an idea what the show's about and um, what our thoughts are on them. But Chris is, went through the list and he decided to tell me beforehand this time where he's at with each one of them. So that's good. I had to tell him like three shows that he has to watch. That's good. But uh, you ready? I hope so. You sure? No. Okay, never mind. We're, we're not doing that today. We'll just do a discussional podcast. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me bring up some new feeds. Uh, but yes, without further ado, let's just let's just start jumping into it and see how many we can knock out. Let's kick things off with Yohane, like I joked about a minute ago. Yohane, the Bahrelian Sunshine in the Mirror, or Genjutsu no ha Yohane, Sunshine in the Mirror. Apparently the Sunshine in the Mirror thing is bilingual. I don't know. Is it? I guess so. I don't know. But yeah, this one is done by Sunrise, so you know it's going to look pretty because, man, they sell them Love Live Girls. It's just money. It's a money printing machine. <laughs> Based on a web manga, I thought it was actually a, a, an actual, like, original, but apparently it's based off web manga, so there you go. And it's a fantasy. And I would probably put music in there with the genres as well, because there's a lot of music. But yes, this one, uh, for those that don't know, Love Lies is a franchise where they have idol girls. It's a school idol groups. Usually you'll have a school, and in this particular universe, one of the most popular things to have in a school is a, pretty much a school idol club. And so all these different schools will compete with each other with their idol groups, and we, typically with each one of the Love Life shows, you follow one of those particular groups. And they kind of gather the, the members of the, the actual idol group and they go out and they perform and they try to get, they win the, the, was it School Idol Festival? That's what it was called. The School Idol Festival. They'll try to win that. Uh, but anyways, one of the Love Live franchise uh, followed this one group. It was Aquars, right? I think it was the Aquars. Sunshine sure. group. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Sunshine. Yeah. No, Sunshine was the, was the title of the group of the yeah they were awkward and the it was love live sunshine yes yeah. gotcha yeah yeah uh but anyways uh for those who don't know that particular one there was a character named yohane and she was like the absolute chuny is chuny can be chuny right and so this is sort of like where she can actually be a chuny like she could be what she was trying to be a chuny for in that she is now in a fantasy world now this is not an isekai it has the character same names and they, they look the same, but they're different characters in a fantasy setting. So you don't have to watch the original Love Live Sunshine to watch Yohane the Parhelion. This is this is literally a fantasy show, but with a musical twist to it. And I, and I think for the beginning segments, it kind of felt natural in the idea that Yohane likes to sing. That's why at the very beginning of the show, Yohane is at like the big city in this world. And she's trying to make it big, and she's failing miserably. And then her mom calls her and says... Come back home. You 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 just had your birthday. You, we we made this decision that you would have this much time to to make it big. You didn't do it. Come back home. So she's forced to come back to her hometown, which is like this kind of remote town that Yohani was originally trying to get away from. It's it's that whole story of the the kid who grows up and says, "I can't live here. I can't you know grow old and be stuck in this just dirt village here. I want to make it big and be in the big city." So she's forced to come back, and you kind of get this whole beginning segment where she's really trying to. Come to grips with the fact that she knew some people in this town. She wants to act like she doesn't know anybody, but obviously one of the main girls at the very beginning is uh, Hanamaru, and Hanamaru immediately recognizes Yohane. Most of the people in the village don't really recognize her, but 
it's sort of her trying to find purpose in this town because she's ha- she's forced to come back and she's slowly kind of meeting people and discovering something that she enjoys doing because that's sort of a, a job that her mom gives her before she disappears <laughs> that uh, she wants her to find something that makes her happy in this village and she's kind of slowly finding you know finding that out so yeah your your thoughts on Johanna the Parhelion. Um, I'm, I didn't watch as many episodes as Andrew, um, but I very much enjoyed it. I, um, one of the things this, uh, Johanna is, is easily my favorite character of all the love lives that, uh, I've watched so far. And I really, really love her. Um, so having her kind of, uh, Chuni side, uh, just going all out on that is really, really excited me. Um, but as I didn't get as far as Andrew, I'm not really sure if they, what I seen of it, it didn't seem like they were really capturing on that. It, it was in a fantasy setting, and I'm hoping that they're going to lean more heavily into a lot of that. Um, her talking about her uh, dark eye and all that stuff. I'm I'm hoping that all that stuff gets uh, revealed later on. Um, but as it is. I'm excited about it. I really did love having her just going, um, having fun. Great soundtrack. I really love her um, as a singer. So having her her songs just going nuts on all that stuff is absolutely fantastic. And of course, it looks great. Like Andrew had mentioned, it being done by Sunrise. And they really, really love uh, these franchises and want to sell them like crazy. So it, it's really nice to have all that. Um, so yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, the show is like too good looking. <laughs> like it, it, it looks gorgeous. They they're literally pumping the budget into the show. It just the character designs themselves and the they're always pretty much. I don't remember really seeing any point in which they were off model. Um, just the backgrounds, everything just looks gorgeous. And like I've kind of mentioned several times before, is Sunrise. They they have a CGI group that's been working on Love Life for a long time. And yeah, granted, early on. It wasn't, like, great uh, CGI. I mean, it was better than most uh, lo- uh, most idol shows where, the, sadly, most idol shows these days, they'll have CGI performances on the stage where, even though it's a 2D show. And I, I think they were a little bit rough at early on, but, man, they've, they've perfected it. <laughs> like, they've absolutely perfected it to the point where it's just, I have to be looking to find it <laughs> because it just, it looks so well and blends in with the show. And the designs, the character designs themselves with the models just actually fit the characters now where they're... Before, you would have, like, whenever it switches to CGI with the performances, it's like, this doesn't really look like the character. Like, they all kind of look the same. It's almost like they just took... The only reason you know that this character is not this character is because they're their hair. So you're just basically going by the hair design um, to really tell them apart. But um, visually aside, like I said, it's, it's a gorgeous show. And the performances were just gorgeous. The The show itself is extremely surprising how much I'm enjoying this now, I do agree with Chris. It, it's kind of shocking to have the character that is the absolute chuny of the chuniest going to this other world. And it's like, she's very toned down. Like, she's not acting like yeah. a chuny. Now, that's not to say that she needs to act like, you know, she has the evil eye or anything like that. But you would expect her to have a certain uh, feeling of, I guess, fitting in with the environment. And she just seems like a normal girl. That's Johanna. She's just a normal girl. So, yeah, I do agree with Chris, even at the point that I'm at with the show, which is like four episodes in, I think, it hasn't really been playing on that at all. It really just feels like here is a girl that is trying to find purpose. And for that story, putting aside my expectations coming into it, that story, I think, is being is being done very, very well. Um, she's a little bit snotty at the very beginning, and again, that's kind of to the, the story that they're, they're telling. She's coming back home. She doesn't want to be there. She hates being there. She doesn't want to connect with anybody. But unfortunately for her, Hanamata is not going to let her get away with that. So Hanamata is going to just drill into her head that she's going to meet people. And I, and I think the the point which you see her really grow is that point where she she tries to do the job that she wants to do, which is doing like fortune telling. But that's not working out very well because she she doesn't have powers. <laughs> so when she kind of just keeps having people ask her to do different things, and that kind of turns into her just being pretty much a jack of all trades. She just, whatever people need... I'm going to do it. She's a gopher. She's a, a, a handyman. She's a, you know, she's moving things for people. Whatever people yell out, hey, Johanna, I need your help with this. She does. And it's through that that she's meeting people. And she's finally realizing that purpose. And now the entire story has kind of had this subplot there that this destruction is going to come to this town. From the very beginning, you see that there's this 
these earthquakes that are happening. Yeah. There's some sort of aura coming from the, the forest itself. And there's this mysterious thing about how Johanne performed on the stump and then suddenly got this staff. The staff has emblems appearing on it, which I can make my assumptions about what that is. Um, Ly- Lylaps is saying kind of side comments here and there, which is kind of make me go, what are you doing with Lylaps? Uh, there's a lot of like little mystery things that are kind of de- developing. And then they have the whole plot of, let's just call her the Demon Lord. There's like this one lady that's on this island that can hear everything that's happening on the island and she's sort of warning them about different issues happening with with the actual village and so how that's going to come into play you know Johanne is almost kind of chiseling at that that shell that's around her heart was really really cute I just think overall it's it's an extremely surprising show that it is a it's a spin-off it's a not any sekai but any sekai this idea of all these characters being in this other world that's a fantasy world and yet, in the middle is just so much heart. There's so much character and just so much development happening with Yohane that it's, it's, it's blowing me away. Which, again, like I said, I assumed it was an original. If this is based on a web manga, I'm guessing this person knows what they're doing. Um, probably should look into the writer. Probably just that's the only work they've done. But, yeah, it's it's a super shock for me. I think the only part that was a little bit like, eh, was this whole kind of Super Sentai segment <laughs> where all the girls just suddenly appear out of nowhere and and start doing stupid stuff to fight uh, possessed deer. But other than that, other than that little segment, which was like, yes, well animated, um, I, I've I've pretty much enjoyed every single bit of the show, and it's, like I said, was not expecting that. Now, granted, I, I was a massive fan of Sunshine. Sunshine. I, that was one of the shows that I, I, me, for me personally, is like the original Love Live is like my favorite of all time, and then Sunshine's like right behind that, and then I have pretty much dropped off after that point. So it is a cast of characters that I really like. I mean, Ruby Best Girl, obviously. Um, she's a cute little fairy. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's 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 great. I'm, I'm super shocked by it. Like I said, I think one of the biggest questions I've had was, do you need to be a Love Live fan to watch it? Do you need to have watched Sunshine? No, on both of those. It's, like I said, it's it. Now, granted, in three episodes, we could come to find out Johanne suddenly unlocks her memories from her previous life and realize that she's a Chuni and that she's supposed to be at a school idol festival. <laughs> but for now, it's it's separate. For now, it's separate. There's no connection except for like verbal tics and their personality is, is pretty close. Um, except for Johanne, which I think, like I said, is probably the biggest departure out of all of them. Uh, Hanamaru still says her Zodaz. Uh, Ruby's still in love with her sister. All that kind of stuff is still there. So, yeah, I, I enjoy it. So... High, high recommendation for me if you're looking for a pretty chill fantasy show with, you know, pretty much every episode having a nice, very beautifully done uh, musical performance that happens at the end of it. So, yeah, that's uh, Johanne the Parhelion, Sunshine in the Mirror. Was it Sunshine in the Mirror? Sun, sunrise in the, in the Mirror? It, it, it's, yeah, Sunshine. Sunshine. Yuki, you have to have your beak down so you snore as loud as possible. Yuki. Moving on, we have Horimiya Peace. Uh, this one is streaming on uh, Crunchyroll. It's running for 13 episodes, I believe. Uh, being done by Cloverworks. This is obviously the pretty much the Ranking of Kings Treasure Chest of Courage version of Horimiya, where they they fully adapted Horimiya's manga, as in from the beginning to the end, but they skipped a bunch of stuff. So this is where they go, well, that was really successful. We don't really have anything else that we want to adapt, so let's just adapt what we didn't adapt. Um, so it's kind of just like a bunch of side story, short joke segments that were completely skipped from the original adaptation. But yeah, uh, I guess I could just jump right into it. <laughs> I really have no opening here. I, I think with the original series, man, it's been so long since the original series, but it was pretty much about like this Izumi person and this girl named Kyoki, uh, Kyoko Hori, since the Hori Mia is Miyamura and Hori. But uh, Hori and Mia, they essentially have this chance encounter she ends up running into this guy that's kind of looks very rough um but he ends up kind of bringing home some or bringing home hori's brother because he was kind of lost and then they kind of realize that oh you're that my classmate and so it's kind of this chance encounter through the brother and him helping him get home that they start hanging out together and hori sort of sees this other side of miyamura that nobody else sees at school miyamura is like he's got like this really long shaggy hair he's got these glasses um, he never, never disclosed, never goes swimming or anything like that. 
And then what she ends up finding out the other side of him is where he kind of does up his hair. He's got tattoos all over him and piercings and stuff. Um, he's just got this other side to him. And that's kind of kind of this one side that nobody else knows except for Hori. But then, like, their relationship sort of develops from there. And then you have all these other characters that get into the mix as well. I think that was the original story. It's been a long time. Wasn't wasn't her hidden side that she was practically a homemaker? And, oh, yeah. She's, like, super and homemaker. And she's, like, super um, at school. She's super tomboyish. I don't remember the tomboy thing, but it could be. Could be. Like I said, it's been, it's been a while. Um, and I, I think that kind of gets into my whole issue with the show. It's not an issue with the show. It's my own personal issue getting into this show. Is when I watched the first episode of this, I'm like, oh God, I gotta watch the first season again. Because, <laughs> I mean, I want to watch the first season again because I'm watching this again. And I'm going, God, I remember I love these characters. And now I remember yeah. why I love these characters. And it's just going through all the characters and these little goofy little interactions that are all just... Again, one side I'm going, I forget what sh what kind of happened with these two characters, but I guess it doesn't necessarily matter because a lot of these stories are kind of early in the manga. Some of them are kind of later in the manga. So it 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 doesn't really make sense that you would have to know how the show ends, but there is certain chemistries between certain characters and relationships that I just don't remember. But it, that that is technically a problem to it as a whole is that it's jumping around in the timeline to cover all these missed chapters of adaptation. So on one moment, you'll have these characters are super close to each other. And this other moment, they're not close to each other. And it's like, okay, I don't know. I almost, I almost wish like every time it jumps to another segment, it just kind of opening says, this is about the point in which they were this much in love or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I know at point in the original series it was at, but it doesn't really matter in the end because it's just more little moments of the characters now I will say that there is there's some hit and miss moments. Some of these some of these segments is like, okay, now I see why they skipped this because this wasn't really that funny. And then there's other moments where it's like, okay, this is a, this is really hilarious. I kind of wish they had this in the original adaptation. Um, but it's just more Horimiya. I mean, the, the ultimate review is if you like the original first season, you're going. I want to say first season. It's the only season. If you like the original Horimiya, you should already be watching this. Um, it is just more great moments of the characters. I mean, they had the whole segment where they did the the cooking uh, the cooking class, and I was like, it it just had me laughing out loud. The whole moment where Hori is doing the painting, and there's this little kind of side story about how you know it does Miyamura get jealous for Hori, or does Hori get jealous for Miyamura, and having them both have a moment where the other person sees them with somebody else, and that jealousy kind of drive up was super cute. Um, I really enjoy it. It's it's always going to be a series that I've. I've adored and just getting more of it's fantastic, even though it just feels very, it feels very disconnected and all over the place is, is the main issue that it has. So, and like I said, some of it's going to be very hit and miss on the enjoyability. So that's my thoughts on it so far. We'll definitely be concluding it. And I don't know I, if I can get some time, I would love to go rewatch the original series and then rewatch this at the same time. So, but again, it could be one of those things of ranking, like ranking of Kings where it might be a, a good one to wait to see somebody kind of put it together with the original first season and then watch it all at once. Yeah. Um, that'd probably work better. So, but I don't know. I, I would have to double check. I don't know if, they, if any of the episodes have like, like they had one sec, one episode was just like, it, it felt like all the, all the jokes around, um, Kotatsu. Is that what it's called? The, um, the heated table. Is it Kotatsu? Yeah. Uh, like every joke was around that. Like an entire episode of nothing but Kotatsu jokes. <laughs> it was like, yeah, this is this is probably. I don't know if all this is in the same segment. Did they have like one chapter where it was just nothing but jokes about that? <laughs> like they finally got it out. So we're gonna have the joke about them getting their legs entangled to each other. We're gonna have this 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 joke this joke. People showing up out of nowhere because they want to hang out in the Kotatsu, falling asleep on the Kotatsu. All that stuff has got to be covered. Um, but no, I don't know if any of the episodes are kind of have like where you would have to watch the first half of this episode in this point or not, but we'll see. But yeah, love it. Hoi me a piece. Definitely a suggestion. Hayaka. I almost said, I did, I did say Hayaka. Ayaka. A story of bonds and wounds. Um, this is not going to be a very long first impressions, by the way. Just going to warn people here. Um, Ayaka is essentially about... Uh... <laughs> so anyways, we, we, we start out in the past where we have this big catastrophe happens. There's these islands um, that all kind of interconnect with this rail system. And there is this these ley line masters. And there is one master of all of them that trains all the ley line masters. 
and this big catastrophe has happened. They kind of explain a little bit later in a couple episodes where there's essentially a dragon of water and a dragon of fire. And the dragon of water is like on slumber or left or something like that. So it sort of upset the balance of power so that the fire dragon got too powerful. And then when it got too powerful, it got unruly and started erupting the volcanoes and stuff. And so the master went and they imply that he sacrificed himself to take out the, the to, to make this fire dragon stop. Well, while this is all happening, um, our main character, Yukito Yanagi, he was evacuated from the place. And since his father died, um, the mayor pretty much had him live with somebody else on the mainland, which was apparently according to the master's uh, request, which is his father, the, the guy that took down the dragon. Um, but so the also part of that request was that when he reached a certain age, when he graduated, he was going to be brought back to the island and he would you know, be allowed to stay there instead. And so he's now returning to the island, and he's learning about the ley line masters. He's learning about his own powers, which has pretty much traumatized him. Because at some point, he was with some kids on a river, and his powers activated and nearly drowned uh, drowned some kids. Yuki! Just get your beak up, baby girl. I'm gonna put a pillow under your chin. I know it's not picking up on the mic, but it's just it's distracting his old kids. And it makes me, for some reason, think that I have to... <laughs> She's so distraffled. She's so mad at you. Good girl. But yeah, this Junji Sagawa, who apparently is like pretty much like a big bro to him when he was younger, shows up, takes him to the islands, and starts introducing him to a bunch of people, shows him a place to stay, um, starts to show him how to control his ley line powers, and then go to each one of the islands, which each one has their own kind of different... It's weird because each of the islands, there's like, I think it was three total islands, and each one of them has a very distinct style to it. Like, there's the one island that's super, uh, more main, not main, um, like big city type looking. There's some areas that are very kind of more cultural, cultural and old school style and everything. But, um, yeah, he's just meeting, meeting a bunch of ley line masters, trying to learn how to use his powers, learning about the, um, Mitamas and that how some of the Mitamas can become corrupted and become, I think they were called, uh, Ara Mitama or something like that. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, yeah. It's just it's a pretty boy show. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, I had some expectation coming to the show, honestly, because I I do like the original creators, which is Gora. Um, they created the original. I don't know if it's a they or it's he. I don't know. Um, I'm just gonna say they. Um, I don't know if it's a group or if it's a single person, but they they created the original K series, and with K series. I acknowledge that it had that pretty boy aspect, but it was still really enjoyable because I like the whole system of the the different groups, the different gangs, basically, with their leader that has, like, the big floating weapons. And then they had getting into the, the later series with the uh, Missing Kings and all that kind of stuff. It was super cool. So it had the pretty boy aspect, but it still had a great story, and the character and chemistry were really fantastic. So even coming into this one and seeing all these, yeah, it's a bunch of pretty boy male characters being introduced, I was like, it's, it's going to be fine because... They at least have good stories behind all this stuff. I'm not really getting that with this one. Like I said, it, it, my jokes aside, that's literally the story is him coming back to the island. Everybody really respects his father. He obviously has this untapped superpower ability that he has to learn how to control it. He's obviously being pulled back to the island because he is the son of the ley line master guy that is super powerful. And it's just him literally meeting a bunch of pretty boys. Here's these two. Oh, they're from this island. And their master is this person. And they want him to train under this master. But no, he's got his 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 big brother, basically, Saigawa, that's going to be training him how to do the lane line master stuff. And there's the corrupted Mitamas, and they beat him up every now and then. I'm not really seeing... For one, I don't really feel so much the chemistry. I think they're doing good with Yanagi, uh, Yukito Yanagi, and his development as a character. Like, he went from literally being afraid of his powers and not wanting to communicate with people because he's afraid of harming people... To being now slowly chipped away at by a very easygoing uh, Jinji. But other than that, like all the other characters, I I just don't really feel. I mean, you have the bad boy with uh, you know Aka Ibuki, and he's he's the one that's using the leyline powers the wrong way because he's he's absorbing the bad um, Mitamas. But it's not like there's not like a good plot line here or anything to go with. Besides, there's a ley line and it can go out of control every now and then, or Every now and then you'll have these Mitamas that you have to be defeat. There's no 
no interesting plot lines around the politics of the area itself. There's no real good storylines with the characters themselves beside, like I said, Aka Ibuki apparently has absorbed so much of the bad Mitamas that he might eventually lose himself. That's it. And that's like, shoot, four or five episodes I've gone through. And I'm, we're almost halfway through the show and I literally don't see anything of value in the main plot line besides the, the guys are hot, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't. There's one female character and she's super cute. I don't know what else to really say about the show. And that's the, that's the frustrating thing is if I can get to that far into a show and not really have much of anything to say about the characters or what they're going through and what they're dealing with and... It's not much to really bite into, and it's not really something that I can recommend to people, so. I don't know, it's, it's almost one of those shows that even if I've gone this far into it and I kind of want to finish it just for completion's sake, it might be one of those shows that I get five or six episodes into it and just say, look, I can't anymore. Like, I just, I'm not getting anything out of this show, but we'll see. But for now, it's just kind of, like I said, a disappointment just because I do like Gora's work, and this is not... Uh, stick with K. <laughs> there you go. Just stick with K. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's... Um, Ayaka. Ayaya. Ayaya. <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do the Ayaya thing, even though I haven't watched it. Uh, Am I Actually the Strongest is our next one. Uh, this one is streaming on Crunchyroll. Uh, this one is uh, done by Staple Entertainment, based on a light novel. Genres are comedy, etchy, fantasy, romance. Uh, but yeah, this one follows a guy who is... Oh, let, me, let me Hold on a second. I gotta think of how it starts. Every single one of them starts differently. I think this is the cell phone one, right? Was he, Wasn't this the one where he, he got bullied at school and he was he was shut in? And I think he was looking at his phone and then it it got... Yeah, it is because I remember the the, the goddess part. So yeah, he's, he's in his bedroom and his phone screen lights up and then it flashes and then he, wake, he, wake, he wakes up in front of a goddess. And this goddess basically says... Uh, you know, congratulations, you've been selected randomly to be, uh, you know, reincarnated. And he's like, okay, that's cool. And she's like, I'm gonna make you super overpowered and everything in this, in this fantasy world, so have fun. And he's like, that's cool, I'll just be OP, I'll use my OP ability, I'll get, you know, all all that I need, and then I'm just gonna be shut in. So yes, this is like the rare, the rare time where a shut in gets his set guide and wants to remain a shut in. <laughs> um, kind of a unique aspect of it. But yes, he wakes up and he is an infant in front of the king of this uh, this kingdom and they're super excited. The, the queen, which is like the name, the Flash something, I forget what her name was. She's like a very well-known hero. Um, both the king and this and this lady, which is the queen, they're excited. And then they bring out this person that puts out this, this orb that's supposed to test his potentials. Um, and so they test him and he comes up with zero two. So... Only zero, level zero, two. two. No, they test him with a two digit. Um, they test him with a two digit tester and it shows that he's only level two. And then they also say, oh, by the way, also he has no aptitude for any element. And they're like, oh crap, this kid's a disaster. We can't have, we can't, we can't tell anybody about this child. This is a, da I mean, that, that would be shameful to them. So the king decrees that they're going to dispose of him and they're going to just tell everybody that he died at birth. So they take him and they put him out in the middle of a forest where he's just sitting there as an infant, just waiting to die, basically. And then this big demon wolf shows up, and he uses his unique skill that was given to him by the goddess, which was barrier magic. So that's why he wasn't shown to have elements. It's because he has this unique ability, which is barrier. And he basically used the barrier to chuck a bunch of trees at the wolf until it submits. And then he uses the barrier to make it to where his infant self can talk. And he pretty much agrees that he's the next demon lord because she's like you got to be the next demon lord he's like yeah that's that's me and then he's like crap i'm really hungry and then she goes oh well i can help with that and she transforms into like a, a female body self with you know the the wolf ears and then she says you, you can have some milk and then she's like oh, wait you, i don't produce milk i we, i gotta you know we gotta do it first and then when she's about to do that this guy shows up now this guy is gordo zenfis and he is a relative of the king and he was notified that they disposed of their child in Miller Forest, and so he decided to come out there and save that child. So he takes uh, Hart, what you call names him later, Hart Zenfis, takes him back to his home, his kingdom, or his his um, area, and then raises him from there. And then we jump forward until he is now nine years old, and he's just trying to be a shut-in. <laughs> he's, he's doing everything he can. He, he develops a clone of himself with his barrier magic, which he hopes to send out in his place so that he doesn't have to go out. But then that clone um, is just it's, as lazy as it, him. Yeah, it's just, he doesn't want to go out. 
He's literally a clone. Um, <laughs> he's a shut in too. Uh, he thinks his sister hates him for the longest time. Then he realizes that his sister was just kind of afraid of him because she did see him like leave at night uh, when there was bandit attacks and stuff like that. So she was, wasn't really sure about him. And eventually she realized that he's been saving people. And so she thinks that she's like this secret savior of the night that goes out in the night and takes down bad guys and comes back under, you know, the disguise of something else. And um, so she gets, she starts clinging on to him. And then he accidentally slips out. He knows about anime and so that she wants to see anime. So he uses his barrier magic to produce uh, television screens out of the barrier magic and then somehow uses the barrier magic to connect to the internet in his past world um, discovers that his Netflix account is still active, so he's able to stream anime to his little sister in this world, and she becomes obsessed with it, and he's afraid that she's going to turn into a shut-in. Um, and then at some point, he tells his father that he doesn't, since he's only level two, he's just going to study ancient art, which was just an excuse to not have to go out. Um, but then he finds out his little sister is, like, versed in, like, ancient lost arts, and that they have a bunch of books in their library, so now he's studying with her about that stuff. And then um, the, the later episodes, they have the the new prince and princess of the his father, his real father, um, come over to visit, and he beats up the the boy because he's a snot nosed kid. And then they start to get into pretty much right now what seems to be like the main focus bad guy character, mama. which is yeah. the mama. Yeah. So he she wants Charlotte, the little sister, dead. There you go. Thoughts. Was it the Flash? I, I think they called it the Flash or something like that. I I, I don't remember it it, it. it yeah, Sword Flash or some or something. I don't know like why that. I'm stuck on that, but it's like <laughs> I'm trying to remember what they're playing with. But no, I I didn't mention. But yes, at some point he's like, I can't be level two. Maybe I'm a three digit. So that's when he went into um, his father's stores and found like this orb that does three digit, and it was still zero zero two. The right. joke is I didn't mention it. The joke is the the goddess messed up because. She, she put him in that position, but messed up and is giving him a thousand and two level. So nobody's used a four digit tester because apparently their orbs do digits for some reason. Um, and so nobody, even him, doesn't even know that he's actually a thousand and two. So that's the joke. That's that's the joke. That's yeah, I only remember the three digit one that showed it in zero zero two. So yeah. Um, yeah, it, it this this show is really it 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 has a strong through line. Okay, I, I'm gonna be very clear. Charlotte, uh, huh? Charlotte's the the strong through line, right? Yes, it's that it, this this show <laughs> revolves the around only good thing about Charlotte. The show. Um, <laughs> she's so freaking and cute. And and occasionally the um the the wolf girl, but unfortunately Wait, she's such never a there. Yeah, I know. It, <laughs> unfortunately, she's 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 so in the background. No, uh, um, in all honesty, this is it. It does sound very all over the place, it and it, it it and and when you're watching it, it does feel like you're you are getting a a. The, albeit very very strange story um it does actually have a decent story it's it's funny how all these things are actually kind of pulling together into this kind of weirdly entertaining thing that they're building um it, they're, they're what andrew hasn't mentioned they're pretty much setting up a sentai group right now i mean it, it as left field as it, it yeah, he, is, he it, wants to be a shut in, but she keeps telling him, go out there and beat him up in your disguise. <laughs> and he literally dresses up like uh, Code Geass, uh, Delulush. Yeah, and, and and now we've got a, a, a red queen. So we've got the black uh, the black leader and we have the red queen. Um, so yeah, we're, 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 all we need is a, uh, about three more and then we'll, we'll have the full team. And then going Flay on. wants to like burn them all alive, but he's like, but Charlotte's <laughs> watching because he's literally creating anime for Charlotte rather than her watching anime all the time. She's just watching him on the monitors of his barrier magic. And, and he's like, Flay, stop trying to kill them. <laughs> You're gonna, I don't want this too violent for Charlotte back at home. Oh, we do know that we're gonna get a, a a blue a blue sentai later, and and then she'll probably be the yellow sentai. So we only need one more after that. Um, but no, it, it's 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 weirdly entertaining. I am really actually getting a kick out of this show. It's just like it, like 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 I'm say, like me me and Andrew are saying, it is really all over the place. There's it, it I but at the same time, it's just weirdly entertaining how they're incorporating all this crap. Like literally, he's. He's got barrier magic, and he's randomly making himself as a baby able to talk using this barrier magic, whatever it does. 
and turning in uh, TVs and connecting to the internet. I mean, like, at, at what point is like, I don't even care anymore. Just do whatever you're. Oh, gonna everybody's do. dying out here. Just put barriers on top of it. Apparently, that heals. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I, I like I said, it is it the greatest of all time. Nah, it, but it is weirdly entertaining, and I'm having fun with it. Yeah, I think that's the only issue that I legitimately have is that it, the barrier magic just pretty much makes everything just so inconsequential. Like he's just he's just massively overpowered, and I mean that's. That's pretty much 90%, 95% of all the set guys anymore is just, here's a skill that makes them overpowered. Let's see them blow up everybody. It, but I, I think sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And this one just kind of, it it's not like it it's like terrible, but at the same time, it's just kind of boring. Like, it's just, okay, there's this issue. Well, barrier magic does it. And it's like, well, how? I mean, I don't want an explanation on how he used barrier magic to connect to the internet in his other word, I'm sure the light novel fully explains it all. <laughs> but for now, it's like, I love how when it opens that scene, he's like, um, so how, somehow I figured out how to get the barrier magic to connect to the internet to my my previous world. But I, he literally says something like, I'm not going to explain it. And I'm like, I probably don't want to, I don't probably care. <laughs> it's like, I, whatever you say is probably to be like, whatever. <laughs> it just worked. Don't worry about it. It just, just don't think about it. He's got Netflix now. Um, but no, I, I, I do agree that it feel it. It doesn't feel like it's all over the place, in my opinion. It doesn't feel like it's random. It doesn't feel like it's chaotic in storytelling. But when you do sit down and think about it, it is kind of. Like, it's it's got multiple threads going on. It's the the aspect the goddess messed up. There's the aspect of him trying to be a shut-in. There's the aspect of his sister wanting to watch anime all the time. There's the aspect that his sister's pretty much keeping him from being a shut-in because she's forcing him to go out all the time to fight bad guys. There's the aspect of the fact that the queen herself is seemingly sending people to attack this town. I mean, they have bandits and stuff are showing up and his father's getting ambushed and he's trying to protect his sister and his mother when they get ambushed. And then you have the aspect of the the prince and the princess coming over to show up and then you have the aspect of the assassination attempts on Charlotte. All this stuff is like all over the place. But it doesn't feel like it's all over the place. And I think that's kind of a a nice thing to say to it and the idea that it, it, it kind of comes together well. But I, I think the the bigger issue is it does have a little bit of an issue of a little bit of whiplash with the the tone of the story itself because it, it it tries to play up things as being silly and fun all the time but then the next minute he's literally having flay burn an entire building full of bandits um burning them all alive or you have the aspect of now suddenly he realizes that somebody's trying to assassinate his sister well i'm gonna kill him okay apparently he's cool with killing people now um <laughs> it just it doesn't it doesn't really have a connection with the gravity of what he's actually doing despite it kind of just shrugging it off i don't really have a sense whatsoever as to heart as a person morally at all it just feels like he's just i don't know maybe the barrier magic has ruined his emotions or something but it just seems like he just so shrugs every situation um but yet other times feels like he's being pretty upset about it like the, the moment his father comes back and all the guys are like bleeding to death and stuff out in the field out in the front of the the building he just goes out there and starts throwing down barrier magics and flays makes some joke about how humans are weak and he's like shut up flay i'm like wait 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 okay okay so he has he's upset he could be upset all right cool but then again like i said later on it's like burn the entire building okay i <laughs> mean we're, we're upset over here but this is we're not gonna address your feelings on this it it, it seems like tonally it's just not quite there um, granted, it's probably meant to be just kind of kick back and have fun, but you're, you're dealing with some heavy subjects here. Like, when it gets to the aspect of her, his sister being assassinated, possibly, he's getting, like, super ticked. Like, he, he's literally being very protective. And I do like that aspect of it, because I think for a while, until I watched the recent episode, I really didn't feel like a connection that he had with his family. Now, granted, I don't want it like a massive... I don't feel like this is the type of show that's going to get into, get, gonna get into some massive inner dialogue about their feelings of family in the new world. But he's lived with them for nine years. You would assume that he knows most about them and they know most about him. But it feels like now at age nine, he suddenly his father is learning about him and he's learning about his father and he's learning about his sister. And it's like, well, what happened the last nine years? It doesn't feel like you've really spent any time with these people. Was he shut in the whole time? They never addressed, they never said that he was a shut in for nine years. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And I know that's probably being super nitpicky. Uh, but yeah, like I joked about earlier, I think my my biggest enjoyment of the show is definitely Charlotte. I think she's super cute. She is she's literally like uh, must protect Smiles' uh, little sister of the of the season. 
Um, she's I just love the whole segment where she keeps following him around. And it kind of shows he's in the bath and with his father. And then over in the corner, you see the red arrow pointing at where she's hiding behind the pillar or he's walking down the hall. And you see the arrow pointing at the end of the hall where she's standing there looking around the corner. Um, it, she's super cute. And I, I don't blame him for being kind of thrown into situations just to make Charlotte happy because you'd be a, a monster if you ever made Charlotte upset. He does technically make her cry, which shame on him. But yeah, it's um, it is enjoyable. Um, I don't really have too many issues with the show, like true issues other than maybe the I, the Super Sentai parts where he goes out and beats the crap out of people is just super boring because he's so overpowered. It, it's it's not doing it in a fun and interesting way. It's just he literally goes out there and bury your magic. Everybody gets beat up. And it's like, okay, you could have just said you beat him up and just move on. But I think those segments are kind of the weakest. But other than that, I think it's it's enjoyable. I think there's not enough flay because she was hilarious in the first episode. And then she just is, she pops up one time to burn a building full of people. And that's about it. Um, so it needs more flay. Um, I'll take as much Charlotte as I can, I can get. And... I will admit, like, the recent episode where it starts to get into the, the Queen and the assassination, I'm kind of interested to see where that goes. Um, I'm sure it's just going to be him going in there and burying magic the entire kingdom to death. <laughs> but it might do something interesting. I, I mean, I do like the fact that it the father technically m made him stop. Because he's like, oh, well, I'm just going to kill the Queen. But then it was an explanation of how important the Queen was to the kingdom that technically, if he did go in there and just kill her, it would cause a revolt and the kingdom would be just fall apart. But then it does beg the question of, well, why do you care? Um, do, do you really care that that kingdom's going to fall apart? Um, so it is interesting, the idea that at least it kind of presented a, but you shouldn't. You can, but you shouldn't. Um, and uh, I think that's what makes me curious as to what how he'll actually resolve it. Um, but it'll probably just be, I don't know, maybe he'll... He becomes he, the king. He'll know. win her over by giving her Netflix, and then she can watch her <laughs> favorite rom-coms. Um, we'll see. But he'll, he'll give him he'll give her a BL uh, manga. No, she, he's probably going to make he's probably going to use the barrier magic to create like um, like niceties, like makeup and stuff. And that'll win her over. That's usually how that's usually how protagonists that are isekai that have overpowered abilities. They'll just introduce makeup and stuff. And that makes them happy. Yeah, um, because women in th those times, that's all they need. They're good. I mean, pharmacy in another world actually went into a really cool con uh, concept with that whole thing, with the technically the chemicals and stuff they used before, which was like lead and stuff, um, and making it more healthy, which was cool. So that's a different show, though. But yeah, that's. Um, I wonder if he'll ever actually run to the uh, the goddess again too. That's that's another question mark. Um, and she'll finally tell him, "Hey, you're a thousand and two. <laughs> I don't know, but I think that's technically supposed to be the joke because he's he's not sure if he's the strongest and. I think that's that's another aspect. I'm so tired of them talking about that. He's just I'm really, I'm really level two. You're really level two. You're really level two. You're really level two. Yeah, I don't know why. Anyways, Atelier Riza Ever Darkness and the Secret Hideout. The animation. Um, this is being done by Leiden Films based on a video game. Uh, genres are fantasy. But yeah, for those that don't know, this one is based on what was it on PS4, Switch, and PC. It was everywhere. Um, Atelier series. Uh, Atelier Riza, which is a long-going series of essentially girls that open up a, sh a shop, an atelier, and they learn alchemy, and then they make stuff, and they gather stuff, and they fight, you know, slimes and stuff, and then they make stuff, and they throw stuff that they make, and this one specifically follows Riza Stout in a different world. I don't think they are actually, I don't think this one is connected. I know that some of the ateliers are the same storyline, timeline. I think this got, one's a new one. They, they, yeah, she's in a different area. Each one of them are in different. Is areas. it the same world? I as tell you far as I, I mean. know, it's the same world. They're just in different zones. Mm, that's interesting. I, I thought that only that was one because that that's that was it called. There was the, one the series that I knew that was connected. Ash, the, well, uh, Colette. They had the yeah. Colette, they had the same girls kept showing yeah, up. And, and and then the Esh uh, and Loji, all those were in a different group in, or in a different area. Yeah. And that's why they would come uh, the first one, and then they would slowly move over in into each one as they would go along. Yeah. Just know, like, like early Runa on and all those. Yeah, I know the PS3 ones that I started playing the Atelier games. They yeah, the, pretty much the first girl was like the one that taught the next girl and knocked the next girl. <laughs> it was like a, a, a lineage. Now, I don't know how the, the zones connect. I, that I, I never get far enough into them to actually 
get to that. But, this one feels yeah. like it doesn't want to go anywhere because they're like, <laughs> they act like there's nothing beyond the, the shoreline, <laughs> which is part of the story. But um, how, how far did you play the actual game? I, I, did, I literally did the opening. Ryza? Like, yeah. Um, I got... I got the the hideout and I got into the actual. Uh, they made their hideout. The stuff. Oh yeah. So you're still further than the show. Yeah. Because they just decided to make the hideout. So we, we're finally getting the title with the show, which I think now we're at like, I think it was episode five, four or five here recently uh, aired, but it had a one hour first episode. So it's been a lot of episodes already. Um, and we're yes, technically I know how they it. go from from zone to zone, but that's that's it's something that the hideout will get yeah. into. So Thanks. yeah. There you go. Uh, anyways, uh, Atelier Riza follows Riza Stout, and she is the daughter of a farming family on this island, and she is, is it pretty much feels like their parents are trying to push upon her that she's going to grow up to be the next one to take over the farm. She hates it. She thinks it's super boring. She wants to go out and adventure. Um, she hates being on the island, and eventually she makes up the, the choice, hey, Lint and Tao, which is her two friends, Lint is basically a training swordsman. Tao is just a bookworm. He's trying to unravel the secrets of these books that were left behind by his grandparents. As essentially, his I think it was his great grandparent or his great gra his grandparent or his great grandparent. One of the two died too early and didn't train the next in line of the family to decipher these books. So he's trying to decipher it now because that was not you know handed down. And um, but no, Riza ends up getting his two friends to go with her, jump on a boat, and leave the island. Leaving the island is like taboo. Like everybody that's on this Kirken Island. Is supposed to like be raised there and stay on there. Uh, they do have merchants that come from the outside every now and then, but they're they're pretty much supposed to stay on the island. Um, so it's kind of taboo that she's jumping on this boat with the two of them, but they do it anyway. So they go out to this, they leave the island, go to the mainland, go on an adventure in the forest, eventually get attacked. Uh, they end up finding this girl, Claudia, who was a part of this merchant group that was coming into the island. Uh, they save her, but then they get attacked by some fairies and nearly die. They're saved by the bodyguard of the traveling merchant, merchant and this alchemist that she was guarding as well. And this kind of inspires Riza, Lint, and Tao. Because the alchemist that's, that saves him, he threw this bomb, and Riza's like, that was really cool. I want to be able to make those too. How do I become an alchemist? And she ends up having the potential to be an alchemist. Um, Tao realized that this alchemist was able to read this writing that was similar to the ones in his book. So he's like, please help me decipher these books for my parents. And then Talent, seeing the bodyguard and how much she kicks butt, and she's super hot, um, and has her to train him in how to be, you know, be a, a proper fighter. And so they kind of decide to to help them out while at the same time they're trying to study these ruins on the island. Um, and so it kind of turns into Ryza learning about alchemy, learning how to gather, Lent learning how to fight, and Tao deciphering the books and learning more about his family's history. And it's kind of a, a cool subplot in the idea that it really does feel like these three, who were essentially being called the brats of the island, you know, finding out that later there's pretty much every generation has brats. Um, they're no different. But they're the brats of the island essentially learning purpose. So Ryza, where she once wanted to get off the island, she hated being there. She found it so boring. Now she's discovering, like, all the things she didn't look at, uh, all the wonders of the island itself that she's now excited about learning about and gathering and learning about the people of the island, how she can help them. Um, so you have somebody that's injured, she can make technically things that can help heal them. Um, learning about ingredients and how that sort of connects to people in their history. And learning more about the this old lady and her history and her being essentially the brat of her generation. Um, it's It's got all those little kind of subplots throughout the whole thing. So, yeah. And then a, and then and a, then really a long beach legs? episode. Beach episode. Really long legs? No. <laughs> Thighs. <laughs> I, 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 that's all I got out of your Thighs. video was the, the really long legs that made her taller Thigh. than, uh, oh yeah, that, that too, <laughs> that, that gives the visuals. Um, so now my thoughts on Atelier Riza, the first episode kind of sucks, um, uh, because it is an hour long episode and it is, it's a schlog. It was a, it was an absolute schlog to get through. It was, it, it was a good setup because it is Riza, you know, deciding to go out on a venture, dragging her friends into it. Uh, messing up, getting in trouble, but then still finding, getting at least some sliver of something that she can do going forward. But then, like, as the episode went along, I'm like, okay, this is actually an okay show. Um, I've never really found a Tellier series to be the most engaging story-wise. Um, I've tried, like, Logi, uh, Eska and Logi's anime and stuff like that. I've played the games, um, especially the early PS3 games. But I've never... They're, they're fun in regards to the 
the, the, the gameplay loop. It is gather, craft, create, fight, gather, craft, create, fight. And the character interactions and these little snippets of, you know, this character's over here in the town. You talk to them and they have that cute, cute little interaction, this funny little interaction between them. Each of those little character moments are fun and the gameplay loop is great. But the overall story has never been interesting for me. I mean, it, that, I, that's always been. If you like the Atelier games for their overall stories, good on you. But well, I've never cared for them. <laughs> Typically, they're always like, you have a deadline. I hope you can make it to this point before then. And then you don't make the, the deadline and then you don't make a successful route. Um, but that was like the earlier ones. I think they kind of got away from that. But I never care for the storylines. And, that, and, and that's that's me as well. I mean, I, I absolutely fully admit I I am big on their gameplay loop. I absolutely love the characters. The characters are absolutely fun, uh, cute. Um, a lot of the character Bye. art is fantastic. Um, so I, I just tend to push through their, their storylines because that is easily the weakest part of that that entire game series. But, um, and I, so I, coming into the show, I honestly wasn't expecting much story lies. Um, I will say that I am, well, I'm not going to oversell this at all. It's, it's literally like a middle of the road type of show. It's like a five, like it's right in the middle. Um, it's enough that I find it enjoyable. And a lot of that enjoyment is essentially characters g gaining purpose, a bunch of kids gaining purpose. They now have something to strive for and they're learning and they're, their eyes are being open to what's around them. Like I said, I think the, the cutest little moment is having Ryza uh, bump into that old lady and she uses this, you know, this healing saw that she's made to help, you know, heal the lady's ankle. But then she gets this whole story about the brats of the last generation and how that ties in with somebody else that she possibly knows in the town itself and reconnecting these old folks to each other. And it was a cute little story. And that was kind of what I've been enjoying it so far, is just seeing that that slow and steady growth of the characters and that purpose they've found and learning new things and this this alchemist and this bodyguard that are kind of just trying to teach these little kids different lessons they need to learn. Like Lint for the longest time is super mad that this this bodyguard won't teach him how to fight, but she keeps pushing on him, like just figure out an escape route, run. Like she's just basically trying to teach him survival first before teaching him how to fight. And it is those little lessons that he kind of realized at some point, okay, this makes sense. This is, there's a reason why she's telling me this. Um, or she's just lazy. She does want to be lazy. But um, at the same time, it's not, it's not great. Like there's nothing, there's nothing fantastic about this show. It, it's visually okay with the character close-ups. The faraway shots are kind of wonky at times. Um, obviously, as the joke keeps going, um, they put a lot of emphasis and a lot of detail into Ryza's thighs. Um, let's be perfectly honest. That's what sold the original game. Um, it's, I think, one of the big, most successful of the Atelier series out there. That's why they paid, they're on three now, right? I think they made three at this point. Yes. Um, it's it's been super successful for them. I think this has been the biggest of the Atelier series. Typically, with the Atelier series, it's always like it's very very cutesy. It's very um, the characters are always like pretty much um, flat as flat as a flat as a board. Um, they're very more petite looking. Well, this was like the first one where they just went, okay, let's just, she's got the curves, she's got the, <laughs> she's got the thighs bulging, um, she's got the chest, everything, um, and it sold like crazy. And they pretty much emphasize that with this adaptation. They just will do any opportunity they can to show Ryza's thighs. Um, that's why we made the joke, it said, tell your thighs up. Like it's, like Chris brought up is the, the, the most hilarious thing that I noticed in the first episode was that Ryza bumped barrel. In, they did do the barrel in the yes. first episode. They did. They did the taro. Um, is it taro? Barrel. So, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they had to go find a barrel, and she she spotted it and yelled out. It was. It was like there it is. I was wondering when this was coming. <laughs> uh, there's. It's an ongoing joke. The barrel. Every time you every, talk to yeah, a barrel, every she yells every barrel. every atelier at some point has to has to have a barrel moment. But um, not barrel roll, just a barrel. A barrel. They have to say barrel. At well, some point. What was this? Oh, no, no, like Chris brought up, there's this moment where they all get together and they're walking down this walkway and Lint is like tall. This is a tall dude. A big long sword. He's tall. Uh, Tao is like probably about a head height shorter than Ryza. So Ryza's kind of in the middle. Um, but for some reason, this perspective shot, even though they're all walking beside each other, you can probably make the argument that Lint was like, you know, down the cliff side a little bit, walking alongside them. But they were trying to bait. You, you kind of argue that the shot was to make it sure that all three of the characters were kind of level with their heads. 
But no, they 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 literally were trying to make it to where Riza's thighs was in the shot. Let's just be perfectly honest. She her thighs were at Lent's waist. That's not possible. <laughs> They well, were trying so hard to get that in the shot. <laughs> no, and, and it's so they funny know because... They sells it, and I'm perfectly acknowledging that. <laughs> I, I got a kick out of it because when, when Andrew had... Uh, when I had watched Andrew's video, I had seen that, and I'm like, my, I, I, I can't disagree with Andrew's point because I either she's standing on some kind of a wall because it, <laughs> you literally have to make but her... But toes right there! Yeah, I mean, you have to literally make her let her... Give her some, some like, extended... Uh, what what are those? The, the, the shoes? The stilt-type shoes? Platformers? Yeah, you have to give her, like, at least five inches, maybe six inches... To get that much uh, height to where her her because basically her hips came into the middle of his uh, his waist. Yeah, because his body proportions were still right. It, it, she just had gained that much height, and it was like, okay, that's just insane. We're trying way too hard. We're just trying, way <laughs> just too trying hard. way too hard. Just do like a just do like a um, portrait shot. There you go. Just do a portrait shot. That way you can keep it in shot. Maybe they do the entire show in portrait. That way they can always have her thighs in it. Um, so did you, yeah. Claudia join yet? She's like on the sideline. She's just recently I, I gained, love Claudia. She's she's essentially trying to gain courage to, yeah. to be a user flute and all that kind of stuff. I don't know how she would fight, but she's just kind of on the sideline, so... <laughs> she somehow got her nose in that she, pillow. <laughs> she she readjusted herself and she was doing fine it, as her head was kind of leaned in. But yeah, you gotta just to mess with my tongue. I don't. Wait, need, I think it's just all on up. the bed. Like she never does that when she's on the ground. So maybe I just did wrong and putting her on. No, the bed. she does it. She, it's just usually back over there in the corner. There so. you go. Perfect. And slowly her chin will because come remember down. that that was that one time that I had tried to adjust her and she nipped at me. Well, that's because you touched her when she was in the middle of a dream. Yeah, so I know. I, was, I'm not I almost got the biscuit. I'm not mad at her. No. But yeah, it's 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 an okay show. Um, I'm I'm su I'm pleasantly surprised by it. But at the same time, I'm gonna say it's gonna be like a middle middle of the road type of show and um, nothing more than that. So give it a shot if that sounds interesting. But there you go. I said, tell your Riza or Thiza, as we joke. Are you ready, Chris, for the most controversial show of the season? I bet you did not. You you didn't watch this, right? Oh, of course not. Because why would you, know, you watch? Why this? would I you ever watch watch a cute waifu show? No, that is definitely not in my. No, it's not a waifu show. This yeah, is yeah. totally uh, about a little girl. They're trying to put in compromised positions. How, nobody should watch My Tiny Senpai. Uh -huh. So we didn't watch My Tiny Senpai, so let's move on. Because nobody should watch My Tiny yeah, Senpai. Yeah, and I would never do something like that. I, I te definitely did not see her uh, trying to call out a cat. Um, <laughs> did not I see her in her pajamas. I totally did not see her in her pajamas. I totally did not see her freak out over a couple of toys uh, uh, landing they on each other. On each other. Yeah, that was I, lewd. I would de I, that was it was super, super lewd. freaking lewd. Um, I they, definitely the crane didn't see game. That. I mean, they were all uh -huh. over each other. It's yeah. like a massive crane game of them all. Angel. Yeah. Anyways, my time. I've never seen any of that stuff. Uchi no kaisha, kaisha no chisai, uh, chisai senpai no hanashi. Uh, this one's about my like project number nine web manga. Is the source? It's a comedy romance with inappropriate content. Uh, but yeah, this one follows a guy named Takuma Shinozaki, who is working at this company, and his senpai is Shiori Kat uh, Katase, and Katase is, very, uh, it's, she's a short stack, that's what we call it. Uh, she's a very short girl with, uh, just very endowed, that's what the, the short stack thing is. But um, that's not really the point, she is super doty of her kohais. Uh, essentially, Shinozaki is her first kohai. And so she was super excited about it, and she has been doing everything to be there as much as possible to help him out, give him encouragement, walk him through things, and likes to encourage him and, and praise him whenever he does good, wants him to always be clear whenever there's problems. She wants to help him out as much as possible because she wants to be the best, um, the best senpai ever. But um, yeah, what at the same time. What did she get mad at when, when they did the, the back in time? She was mad about something, and I she was just remember. like super focused on waiting for him to bring up something. Oh yeah, and, and he thought looked, that she was glaring at him. at him. 
Um, he's like, he's so worried about asking about the password. She's <laughs> waiting. And then she jumps in there and says, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but no, obviously, uh, everybody else around them is acknowledging this, especially their manager. Um, whereas most companies kind of discourage relationships and uh, companies. This is an anime. So the manager wants to get in on it. So he's constantly sending them out on errands and stuff together so that he can possibly get them, you know, stuck together. But um, yeah, very quickly, you kind of see that Shinazaki is just thinks that she's like the cutest thing ever and that she's super helpful and that she's super sweet. Uh, Katase at the same time, thankfully, very quickly is starting to get those doki doki feelings as well. I think it was about the time where he kind of offered her his jacket and she kind of, you know, just felt it was a really nice offer and didn't realize that it was making her a little heated up and then said, you know, you have your jacket back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole, the doll things like confirmation, they, the, the both of them are pretty much acknowledging that they like each other. But um, yeah, just the, the random shenanigans, different tasks they have to do and how Katase helps her Kohai and how he uh, likes the help and tries to do his best to to kind of do right for her. So, oh yeah, and there's also a childhood friend. She pretty much is on the sideline. At some point she mentions that she, when she first started working there or when she first went to interview, uh, a Prince Charming showed up and she was super doki doki to him. And then she realized it's the manager and that he's a total idiot. So I'm sure they'll, She's just being Sunday, though. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that they're going to ship the crap out of all that. <laughs> Eventually, she, you'll realize she's uh, she's Sunday. She actually likes him. So, your thoughts on my Chisai senpai? Uh oh, I didn't make it clear. I freaking oh, you didn't love watch this it. show. Oh, uh, you didn't watch it? Oh yeah, I definitely didn't watch oh. it, and I definitely if you did I, watch it, you would probably I, hate I, it, right? Yeah, I definitely <laughs> would hate it. I mean, it's I mean definitely not clearly. Um, loving this show in any way, shape, or form, but you know, if you because, watched it, you would know that they probably had a stupid like guy gets sick episode, and she has uh, to help him out. Trope. <laughs> Gosh. But yeah, I, in all actuality, I love this show. I, I think it's freaking adorable. Um, I love all of the side characters so far. I don't think anything has really irritated me yet. Um, pretty much everything has just worked for me, and it, it because. I mean, it it's just adorable. So, and, and that's what I came here for. It was adorable, cute ro uh, romance type show. So that's pretty much it. It needs more edgy. It, it really does. No, it's it's funny because this is one of those shows where like the controversy makes me want to love it um, because you know just stick it to them. But honestly, it's like this is the most non-controversial show ever because it's so tame. Like, I think the most risque moment they've had so far was she already... Holding hands? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Is <laughs> um, did they hold hands? I don't remember, but... <laughs> I don't think they did. If they, they did, they it would did, be they, they did get under the, the, no, the She went under umbrella. his desk. They went under... Oh, yeah, that was... What, that was what? the most risky part. Is she went under her desk at her pin, and then he... Because, you know, it's anime. He has to not know that there's a person's butt hanging out the bottom of the, the desk and just goes over there and sits down. And so when he looks down, she's, like, literally, like, you know, a... Um, was getting my pen. She got under his umbrella, and that's really, you know, lewd. But in and then even after that, she had an umbrella. Had an that an was umbrella. cute. That was super cute. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was super cute. She's like later. He's like, wait, I had an umbrella. Um, that was really cute. I I, I smiled a lot with that one. <laughs> but no, like the most risque part was that, and it was the whole like massage thing. Like because she has to obviously moan a little bit when he's giving the massage, but or at least his that was in his head. But in that, it's like a super safe show. And that's sort of why it's kind of... It, like It's non-traversial because it's very safe. It doesn't have etchy. And it's just a kind of cutesy rom-com in, in an office space. But that's sort of where I'm kind of frustrated because I'm like, I almost kind of want it to have some etchy or something in here to really mix it up. Because for me personally, it's like, it's a sweet show. Um, I think it has these really cute little moments, like the umbrella thing was super cute. Um, the whole uh, writing the person's name on the hand and eating it to get rid of that, that, that fear and stuff for the, your presentation was super cute. And her holding up her hand after she drew on it uh, was super cute. That was lewd, too. They, um, It's just, it's kind of blah other than that. Like, I love the crane game. I love the dolls and her freaking out about them falling on each other and, and envisioning what they kind of mean, that they both look like each other. But, the, like, everything in between there, like, these, these like, five really good moments in the show, it's just kind of, it's very tropish rom-com. Like, it's just, 
it's take all the usual trope scenarios from a school rom-com and then just put them in an office space, which I do appreciate. I like having a rom-com that's in office space. That's why I liked um, things like the Love is Hard for Otakus. I love that type of stuff. Uh, working. I love workplace romance and rom-coms. Um, serving next service. This one's just kind of very stale. And I think the thing that I sort of came down to for it, because there's a good, it's a really good comparison that you can give for another show, and that is My Senpai is Annoying. That show is literally this, but you just flip the contrasting characters, because in My Senpai is Annoying, you have the Kohai is the short girl that's not stacked, and then you have the Senpai is this big, burly guy. Whereas this show, the Senpai is the short stack, and the, the Kohai is the tall guy. But the thing that made Senpai as annoying so great is the writing was so on point. Every scenario was so clever. And it didn't feel like it was playing tropish scenarios. And the side characters were fantastic in that show. This show just does not have a good supporting cast. Like, the supporting cast is boring. Like, the manager is just obsessed with them getting together. The, the childhood friend just kind of stands there and makes comments about how dumb the manager is. I don't feel anything with the side characters and the main characters, while the contrast is there, the cuteness is in the contrast of how the different size, the height, but other than that, it's just, it's, it's just Katase's cute. And that's not really, unfortunately enough to really sell me that the show is great. It's fine, but I just don't feel like the writing's really there. I just feel like it has, its selling point is how cute Katase is and that she's a short stack and that yes, people short stacks exist. And I love the fact that the shows exist just so that we can remind haters that short stack people exist and they should be loved. <laughs> and Katase should be loved. Um, but other than Katase being super cute, I just, I don't feel anything about the show and the writing or anything else. So it's, it's, it's another kind of middle of the road show for me. Um, and I'll still be watching it because Katase is cute, but it's definitely not a show I'm going to go out of my way to, to tell people to check out unless they just want to stick it to the controversy. Which that was originally, I think, the thing that helped it. I, it's, it's one of those nice things because, like, I think early on, I seen a lot of people that were commenting, going, "I didn't know about this show existing until people were complaining about it. Now I know it exists. So I'm gonna watch it." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, good job, thanks for the advertisement for the show. Uh, but yeah, that's um, my tiny senpai. So, level one demon lord and one room hero. This one is streaming on High Dive, running for twelve episodes, done by Silverlink and Blade. Source of the web manga comedy fantasy or genres and this one follows the demon lord as they were fighting the hero's party and the hero's party is at their last leg and then they stand up one last time to to try once again to take down the demon lord and the hero jumps up there and he slashes at the demon lord and the demon lord's like uh oh, gosh i'm done for but i'll be back and uh just you wait i'll, I'll revive and i'm gonna take you all out and my minions are just gonna let them live on and we'll see you you know next time and then jump forward, and the Demon Lord has been, has woken up again. But she, he, the Demon Lord, <laughs> haven't established gender yet. I think it's just completely uh, neutral at this point, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, the the assistant says uh, he, so I'm going to assume it's a guy. Um, the Demon Lord reawakens, awakens too early. So it does not have their full potential. So with that, their form is really small too. And so as their assistant, Zinnia, is trying to get them all caught up on... You know, everything that's going on in the, the castle and everything. Trying to get him new outfits because obviously he can't fit in their old outfit. So Zinnia is like dressing him up in different uh, outfits like a sailor uniform and all this other kind of stuff. And eventually uh, Mao is like, uh, so what about Max, the hero? I, I How is he doing? And Zinnia's like, uh, don't worry about him. Uh, anyways, let's move on. And then Mao's like, no, I want to go see him. What, where is he at? And, and then eventually Mao's like, forget it. I'm just going to go see him right now. Jumps up in the air to go fly away, and Zinnia, the assistant's like, you're going to regret it if you go see him. Don't do it. And then so Mal darts off, flies through this area. There's a bunch of skyscrapers and buildings, and eventually finds a small little apartment and flies in there to go see the hero, Max, who's literally a deadbeat, sitting alone in an apartment, uh, letting himself go. The, his sword's in the corner on a bunch of on a bunch of trash. And Mal's like, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> Well, as they're talking, you kind of find out that, uh, well, not as they're talking, Mao literally opens up a laptop and starts searching the internet for Max and ends up finding out that essentially after after the, they defeat the Demon Lord, um, Max claims that, you know, mankind didn't, didn't need a hero anymore, so they just pretty much discarded me. 
And then she's looking, you know, Mao's looking through all these different articles and finds out that he's been caught up in like scandals and stuff like that. He was with some some women that were married. Um, he got in a fight with a bunch of people and beat him up. And it's pretty much ruined his entire reputation. Everybody hates Max now. And he just pretty much hates society in general at this point. So he's just kind of just getting by day by day, um, looking at, uh, you know, just having some fun time on the Internet every now and then in privacy and just wasting away. So Mal's like, well, OK, well, I'm going to go destroy the world. And he's like, I don't care. We'll go ahead and destroy it. It's like, you're not going to try to stop me. No, I don't. I don't care. All right, well, I'm going to go rest. I'm going to get myself powered up and come back. And then he goes to leave and then comes back and starts cooking him dinner. And so it kind of turns into Mao. You get a sense at this point that Mao really likes Max. Like, he keeps talking about how he's all chiseled abs and everything. <laughs> Zenia knows that Mao is obsessed with Max. Um, there's quite a question mark there at this point if Mao just loves Max. Um, but Mao just basically making the excuse that he's going to stay there and take care of Max cook him food and all this kind of stuff while learning about society while he regains his power. And we all know it's just because he wants to help Max. And that's kind of the, the shtick so far. Um, we had Zinnia show up, start staying there nearby. Uh, Zinnia gets drunk and chases Max throughout the, the town, and that gets becomes a scandal. Uh, Fred, who is the healer of the, the party, or the cleric of the party, uh, shows up and wants him to get involved with this fight the kingdom's having with this with Leo, who was the the warrior of the group, he apparently uh, is creating this resistance group to come in and, or it's basically a terrorist group to come in and take over the kingdom. And he, Fred, wants him to help him stop Leo. And that's um, pretty much where we're at. It. Thoughts? I've really enjoyed the show. It's um, there's there's a lot of kind of nuggets in here that is it. it kind of i i it's it's one of those shows that i kind of want a resolution to everything so fast and mm -hmm. and i know that this is trying to be more kind of breadcrumbing along uh along the road but there's so much here that can be just dissected um so i i i want to be a patient with it but at the same time i want everything all at one time i want it all done now um it's, I want it, and I want, I want it now. Um, it's it's funny how like the the discarded uh, hero. I mean, all the scandals that he he's gone through. Obviously, he he was a scumbag. It seems it, like it implies that he played his part. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, like it's, the reason why he's pretty much broke up with his friends and everything. It seems like he was a part of that. Like he he left them. Didn't like they had some sort of outpour, uh, some sort of dispute. My prediction is it's probably something to do with the the female the of the form, party because she's not. Yeah. I, we haven't seen her yet, and I'm assuming she's dead. And, and that that's that's a that's lot of probably it. Probably been his it was his downfall. That that's that's the and thing. how she dies the question mark because they beat the demon lord. If she died, I wonder what happened. And and that's 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 a lot of the things that I that I wonder is it, it it's it's playing this up and making it into something so i'm i'm hoping that there's a good payoff for that and that's that's one of those re the things that i like i said i i want it and i want it right now i want to get into this this i this. want the world um but <laughs> up until then it, there's a lot of fun here i i really do like the interplay uh with a lot of the characters um it it, it seems uh, um uh Mao uh, trying to recruit him in this la in one of these last episodes was absolutely hilarious. Just uh, all the all the girls in in the demon uh, demon realm, and and you can pick any one of them. And of course, the first half of the book was uh, of Zinnia. <laughs> it's uh, I, and then finally they uh, she she ultimately falls. Okay, well, what about? This and then she turns herself into her JK. I thought they were gonna is, wait on that one. Yeah, I really it was they were on that one because like, um, when, when I did, I'm like, okay, I thought that was gonna, I thought this was gonna be a long running joke, but no, it was like, oh no. Nope, but yeah, one. Mao's JK version is absolutely beautiful. So I, I I love it. I um I've had a lot of fun with the show for sure. Just to give you an idea, Mao turns into like uh, like a late teens, twenty year old female body. But the outfit's still the same. And <laughs> Mao's like original self is this little scrunchy chibi self. And so the outfit's very skimpy. <laughs> um, but no, the, the biggest shock that I have for this show is that it's way more wholesome than I thought it was going to be. Like super wholesome. 
my my thoughts coming into it when I seen the previews and the art and everything, I thought there was going to be like, Max is a deadbeat, Mal shows up, they start living together, shenanigans happens. I thought this was going to be a full-on comedy. I mean, the genres are comedy and fantasy. But there's like so much, there's so much to this show and it's kind of shocking because it's getting into the dejected hero. It's getting into how much he hates society itself and how much it's kind of ruined him and how he's ruined himself. The aspect of how it seems like Mal really does care for Max, wants to get him back on his feet and help him. And Max is receptive at time, but not really most of the time. Um, it's only been here recently that he's finally like, okay, I need to get a job. Like, I'm going to finally do something. Um, it's 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 really good in that regard. And getting the story of, you know, the hero's party itself and how they met, bringing in Fred to the party, which I'm not super sold on Fred yet. He seems like he's really the gray area. He's the, he's the hero that will do whatever he needs to do in order to get the job done, even if it is, you know, blackmailing Max into to coming with him. Um, really curious to see what's going on with Leo, what his whole thing is. My assumption at this point is, like I said, my prediction is going to be the idea that the, the the female of the party died. Again, since they did defeat the hero, or the demon lord, is it that maybe uh, they had some sort of truce with the demons after the demon lord died? Maybe one of the demons killed Yuria and the mankind didn't do anything about it and that made Max angry? Um, did Leo see this too and his way of resolving it wasn't just to become a shut-in like Max did, but actually fight the kingdom and that's why he's making this other group? And maybe Fred himself is like, no, we're fine with this kingdom, let's stick with it rather than destroy it. I, I'm, I'm feeling like the three of them are going to be three separate sides of a the same problem. And why I have expectations for that is because it's sort of shown me that this writer is doing something with this. This is not simply... What would it be like if the Demon Lord's trying to rehabilitate the heroes so that they would fight them again? No, it does feel like it's trying to get into PTSD. It's trying to get into the dejected hero. It's trying to get into uh, the politics and what the heroes do after the Demon Lord is dead. Um, it's trying to get into all that stuff, and I think it's doing a really good job of it. And it's not its not heavy, don't get me wrong. It's its wholesome. It's, it's doing good with the characters. Every now and then it gets kind of heavy with Max kind of walking around the street and just looking for the next kind of... Um, entertaining fix, I'll just say that. <laughs> but I, I think overall, it's it's just doing a very good job of balancing the comedy, the the lightheartedness, and every now and then kind of throwing a little quick jab of the heaviness of Max and how he's kind of lost his uh, his joy in life, which was to fight the Demon Lord and stuff. But yeah, it's 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 super good. Uh, the animation is really good as well. Um, obviously, Mao's Seiyu is perfect. Uh, they could not pick a better person. It's basically Jahi Sama. Yep. Um, she just, she just nails the, the short, stubby little uh, delusions of grandeur fighter of, of demon kind, basically. Um, but yeah, super good. A lot of really funny moments so far. I really am curious about the, the closet ghost. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're, we're all wondering what the hell the closet ghost. I, I do have a thought of the, the, the ghost being the, the female, but I don't think it's. I be thought about that too, but I think that's way too I think too that easy. Fred would notice somehow, but Fred's just terrified of the ghost. He was absolutely terrified. <laughs> he's like literally going to open this door because he knows the demon lord's in there and he's just like, a ghost is what scares him. <laughs> a pastor guy and he's fought the demon lord and a ghost scares him. It was so funny. He just kind of keeps backing up and runs out the door. Have you ever um, looked in your closet? Yeah, it's like the only person that does not recognize the ghost is Bax. Like, it, it's either hiding from him or he just can't see it. Uh, but the ghost is extremely on dairy, too, so I'm curious how that's yeah. going to go. Uh, she was not liking him looking through that book of, of demons. Like, one of them was, like, really good. And then, like, I knew it was going to... I think I seen at some point scales in the back. I'm like, it's going to be a, a Lamia or a, a snake woman, isn't it? Yep, it's a Lamia. Well, it was pretty obvious when it didn't show the lower half of the body. Yeah, it was, it was like, that okay. was another giveaway. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was partly because that. I mean, it could have been that, or it was going to be the horse. But yeah, I kind of figured it was going to be a Lamia. But yeah, good stuff. I I have been I've been really enjoying this show. Uh, cannot wait for more of it. It's 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 fun stuff. It's fun stuff. The one game lord, one room hero, Masamune Kun's revenge or. I'm not going to get... Uh, this is another one like Ayaka. I'm not going to get too much into details here. So if you're looking for an in-depth first impression, you're not going to get much from me. This is another one of those ones where it's like, I think... I didn't realize it until today. First season. When was it? What's your, what's your guess? Which year did, was the first season? Because you watched first season, right? Uh, I thought you liked I don't the first remember. season. Uh, I really liked it. Um, 2017. Six Gosh, years, really? Chris. 
I was gonna say about five years, but man, I guess well, I guess six years would be about the same. I was shocked when I seen that. I'm like, wow. Um, that explains why <laughs> when I because I had just fired up this because I remember like the basic story. Like for those that don't know, Masamune Kun's Revenge follows Makabe. Uh, when he was really young, he really liked this girl. Um, she was nice to him. She was this. Uh, rich girl and at some point he went to go visit her one day needed her help and she literally opened up the window and said get out of here pig's foot i don't care for you i've never liked you and then he that just completely traumatized him enough that like typical with anime he spent his entire life getting fit working out getting super hot learning all the new styles getting his hair perfect he's fit he's got six packs and everything all for the day that he'll go to he'll go to school with her again and he will swoon her over her heart. She won't recognize him. He will win her heart. And then when she just finally confesses her love for him, he'll dump her. And that will get his revenge. That's his whole life. His whole life purpose is for that moment. It's dumb, I know. Um, but that was like the basic concept. And you had like the maid that was trying to help him out. Um, the maid of the girl that he's trying to, to destroy. Um, you had this other girl that liked Ma uh, Makabe and confessed to him, and he rejected her because his focus right now is to to destroy um, Aragaki, who is the girl that that called him Pigfoot. And that was kind of the basic story, and I remember I kind of remember mo most all that stuff. And then when I fired up season two or Masamune Kun's Revenge R, I'm like, I, I still know Makabe and Aragaki, and I remember the maid. I don't remember all the weird stuff around the maid. But now it's like, and I remember, I remember the other one that was supposedly trying to act like he was, um, Kanetsugu. Kanetsugu was somebody that was trying to, because Makabe is not, is trying to make sure that Aragaki doesn't know that it's him. She doesn't, he doesn't want her to know that this was the fat little boy that she rejected. So he's going under a different name. This other person shows up out of nowhere and they're trying to act like him and get with him or get with her. So that's the whole kind of weird conundrum they were building up towards the first part of the first of the uh, the first season. Going to the second season, I'm like, that. I kind of remember all this stuff, but at the same time, I I'm a little bit that. lost. Um, but it's it's slowly coming back to me over time. Um, and I, I, truth be told, people, if you like this show, I am going to be the worst person to get an impressions on because I did not like the first season at all. I didn't like it. I just think it's so. It's so over the top, malicious. It's so uh, ridiculous. The I, the concept itself is ridiculous. Somebody spending their whole life working out to dump somebody. Um, it's just kind of got that whole. You know, it's a misunderstanding. Like from the very beginning, you're like, you know, this is a misunderstanding. You know, she probably didn't call him that. You know that something's going on behind the background. You know that Aragaki's not a terrible person. So there's got to be a reason for all this stuff. So it's one of those ones where we're building up two seasons now of a misunderstanding so how can that at all be enjoyable for me personally it doesn't work the shenanigans the, the moment to moment shenanigans are fun they they do get in some fun little rom-com jokes here and there um but the second season like it's hitting more heavier on the seriousness of these characters and what they're going through and i've since i've never really felt it's it's serious tone works now that it's getting more serious it's more ridiculous for me. And that's what my problem is going into the second season. And like I told everybody when I get, when, when I was going to think of going into the second season, I wasn't even planning on doing it. Um, but I just kind of fired on to see if I, if, if I would get into I'm it gonna, again and it didn't work. I, I remember liking it, but I don't remember what it was that I liked about it. And I definitely, Makabe is kind of, when you mentioned, when Makabe is not being, I think I remember him. So maybe I, maybe I wasn't, I did, I, I got farther into it than I thought. And I, so I'll, I'll check out the last couple of episodes and see if I watched it and try Cause I, I thought I, I didn't get that far. I will admit, despite the fact that I hate the concept behind the main character and I hate the fact that he's going through all this effort and breaking hearts just for the sole sake of breaking somebody's heart. He is a very unique and at times very entertaining main character. He's a he's definitely a shift from the normal main characters that you typically get. But I don't know, I, I think at its at its core it's such a it's such a malicious type of concept that I just I don't think I've ever gonna I, I don't think I've ever enjoyed it, nor do I will ever will. But I will admit that like I'm kind of thankful that I'm at the point now in the show. I'm hoping Dear goodness, I hope this is not just a rug pull. 
it feels like right now and it, and it doesn't make it doesn't make sense that it will be right now because I think we still have like six episodes, maybe seven episodes. It feels like it's finally getting to a possible reveal. I hope to goodness it's going to be the big reveal um, because the first fake out reveal in the second season was a flop. And now they finally kind of revealed everything. So I'm hoping that we'll kind of finally address where it could possibly go. And it could actually be, it could actually have a satisfying ending. I don't know that the journey will be something I can recommend to people, but I think it might actually have a satisfying ending. So I'm, I'm probably going to stick with it just because I feel like I have a shred that this could actually have a satisfying ending, despite the fact that the, the setup sucks and it's stupid. <laughs> but we'll see. That is my terrible first impressions of the second season. Um, take all of that and just throw it away and act like you didn't hear me say any of that. Um, we'll see, though. But yeah, that's uh, Masamunikun's Revenge R. Undead Murder Farce is our next one. This one is, I'm sorry, it's Undead Girl Murder Farce, uh, but they changed it to Undead Murder Farce. I'm, I'm guessing Undead Girl. I don't know. I don't know why they changed it. But anyways, uh, being done by Lapin Track, based on a novel, mystery, supernatural, the genres. And the director is Shinichiro Omata, who of course, or Shinichi Omata, who did Kage-sama Love is War, Shogun Roku Raku Shinju. Um, he's amazing. Always will be amazing. Uh, but yeah, this one follow. this takes place in Japan. It's got like this moment, um, it's like feel Japan. You have this kind of point in which mankind in the past had this like hunting of the Oni. Like they they set up this new like hunt. Everybody went out. They killed all the yokai and evil yokai of the world. Just wiped them all out. And we follow a guy that is a Oni, um, Suguru. And he was, he's basically in this um, like this underground boxing match kind of set up where they'll have him fight different yokai. They stick in the ring with him and he slaughters them and they make money. And at some point he notices somebody's following him around and he ends up confronting them, which is Suzuku, this maid that's carrying around this, uh, this cage. And then out of nowhere, this voice calls out and it's this Aya Rindo. And he's like trying to figure out like, how's this maid talking without moving her mouth? That's kind of a weird trick. Well, then the maid opens up the cage and there's this head in it. <laughs> this, 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 this head just sitting inside this cage, this little bird cage. Um, this is Aya Rindo. Aya Rindo is an immortal. But at, unfortunately, in her past, at some point, this old man showed up and took her body and left her to, to die, basically. But since she's immortal, she didn't die. Well, she wants Suguru to kill her because Oni have the ability to kill immortals. And um, so that's pretty much they're assuming is probably why her body didn't grow back is because an Oni beheaded her and they took her body. But she wants Suguru to kill her because she hates being just a head. And he's like, realizes she just explained to him somebody that he knows from his past that was involved with him. And so he proposes to her instead of killing her, which she was going to offer to extend his life uh, lifetime because the more an Oni fights, the more they die or they become susceptible to the, de the demon side. Um, instead of killing her, he's going to help her find this guy, and they can find him together and get her body back. And so she bestows upon him some of his saliva because she has to give her something of his, her body to give him more life. And then they start traveling together and trying to find this guy. And then from then it kind of turns into at least one story so far, but I'm assuming it's going to be like different stories of different mysteries, and they solve it together. Uh, people call them the they people call him the cage carrier or something like that, the cage bearer, which is basically Suguru carrying around this cage of this head. And they just go to different locations. Like I said, currently they went, um, they left Japan, went all the way west, and they confronted a vampire family who the wife of the family was murdered. And so they have to discover who killed um, the mother and how they killed him. And so it goes into a whole who done it, how done it, why done it kind of situation where Rindo figures it out based on the evidence in the the mansion. But yeah, that's, um, they've only really, really gone to that story so far. They just wrapped up that, that mystery and they're heading off to the next one, which I, they're insinuating it might be Lupin. I'm not sure. This, this world, they're, they're hitting on all the different stories. I mean, they've already brought up Sherlock Holmes. Um, what I'm assuming is Frankenstein's monster, Lupin, um, Dracula. They're, they're, they're they, they, all the mythological stories and stuff of the past is all being brought into this one story. So I'm sure Jack of the Ripper and stuff will pop in there at some point. But, um, yeah, my thoughts so far. First of all, 
visually, directing is amazing. Like I've said before, Shinichi Omata, Kaguya-sama Love is War, Showa Gunroku, this director is just amazing. I, I, I think... I, at some point, I'm going to look through this person's entire repertoire and have to watch everything that they've directed because this person just knows how to do visual storytelling along with regular storytelling. When there's dialogue happening, there's something happening. And obviously, this being a mystery, murder, figure out all the, you know, lots of information is being, you know, talked about. He's just keeping things happening on the screen. Like, they have this whole situation where Ayarendo is like, it's weird because I th you you think that you want to die because what you're doing right now you're doing cage matches you're fighting and that obviously will will kill you eventually. Why are you doing this? It seems like you want to die, but then you don't want to die because when you fought my maid you were fighting to survive. Um, she's offering him extended life, so why would he take it? And he kind of goes into explaining the whole why he's doing the ring fighting is because he knows eventually he's going to die, but he's fighting in the ring because he's hoping that he'll keep giving a performance. Until eventually, the crowds keep gathering, and eventually he'll do his last performance. It's the moment that he actually gives in to his other side, goes berserk, and kills everybody that's been cheering him on, watching him kill other Oni. He'll finally get the revenge for all of them. And as it's telling the story about what he's going to do, it's giving a visual spectacle of him literally raising his hands, and, and it's got this one shot where he's inside the cage with Ayarendo, and she's humongous, and she's looking down on him, and she's doing all these really cool creative things with visuals to give that spectacle of what he's about to perform. All the while, in actuality, physically, he's sitting there crouched down, petting a dead cat that the day before everybody was trying to hunt down and kill, this feral cat. And so it's like, again, it's it's internalizing his own grandiose ideas. And that's, again, that's this director. This director is so good at giving you something while something's happening. Um, and he's a performer. Suguru is a performer. And that's kind of seen in after they wrap up the next arc with the vampires is they have this fight. And Suguru is still giving a performance. As he's talking about who he is to this, this, this uh, bad guy... He's just doing a performance. He's literally like he's in the middle of the arena trying to cheer on the, uh, get the, the, the crowd riled up. I love that kind of attention to detail that constantly reminds you of who the character is, gives you a visual style of it, while at the same time telling the story, which is each of these mysteries that they're going through. Um, Ayarendo is fantastic. I love, love their chemistry. Suguru and Ayarendo, which I think is for a show like this where it's a, yes, there's the maid there, but it's, it's essentially Suguru and Rendo. They're the chemistry. They're the pair. They're the duo that's solving all these mysteries. And what I've already seen with these first... Was it four episodes now? I think they did four. Yeah, it's four episodes. The four, first four episodes is great chemistry. Like, these two just... They bounce off each other so well. Like, Suguru will make some stupid comment. Like, when they first meet the vampires, um, a thing that it seems like Ayarindo likes to do is every time she meets somebody new... She likes to see the looks on their faces as they discover who she is. So they always come in and everybody thinks the maid's talking. And then he'll, they'll reveal that she's inside the cage and that she's just ahead. And everybody's shocked, obviously. And then Suguru will point Ayarindo to everybody so she can see what their expressions are. When they revealed it, they were shocked because it was a female. The, this great detective is a female? I thought it was going to be a, a boy. And so Suguru makes the comment of, um, yeah, we get that a lot because she doesn't have much of a chest. Obviously, because she literally has no physical chest because she's just a head. And she says something like, um, she's a coup the maid. Uh, make sure to hit him later. Um, but that was kind of funny. And then Suguru, like, points his face away and starts laughing. It says their chemistry is perfect. Um, it is It is literally, I think, the main reason why I want Chris to watch this show is because it's like, because you, you didn't watch it, right? I think you said you didn't watch it. Um, it. It's very quickly becoming one of the ones that I'm probably because <laughs> I'm talking to it. It's just their their chemistry is perfect. I, there's something about it that just absolutely screams that it's this is going to be perfect style. for me. It's style. It's chemistry. Um, Rendo's great so far. She's, I mean, I already when when I watched the the if I remember right when we were doing the the music podcast, I was saying that I was oh yeah, the OP and the ED is great. I, I, I there's there's so much about this this show that's just screaming that I need to watch it. So it's the, the probably is... but but see, there's a couple of other ones that An Andrew's been trying to get me to watch, and this one is the one that's irking me the most. That yeah, I I'm pushing watch them, it. right now. I'm pushing them on my Happy Marriage for sure, like above all else. Um, probably Undead Murder Farce and Dark Gathering. I think those three. Yeah. 
it was Dark a, it was... Gathering is probably the lowest of the three that are that I'm very very interested in and I need to catch up on. But yeah, I, I think you would like this one just because of the the chemistry between Suguru and and Rendo they're just, they're just great. Like they have this whole moment where she goes, okay, well, I have an idea of at least how we can find the person that killed her. And she goes, there's seven reasons why I think it's kind of focused on this point. And they start going through it. She's, she's, of course, Suguru's always got to carry her around. Every now and then, Shizuku will, but most of the time, Suguru's carrying her. And so he only has one hand. So he starts to, he, she's like, uh, Suguru, put up your fingers because she doesn't have any fingers. So she has him do the counting. So he lifts up one finger, goes through to five. And then when he gets to five, she's like, oh, okay, now six. And he's like, uh, Rindo, what is it? I only have five fingers. She's like, okay, well, lift, lift your feet then. So he lifts up on his foot, <laughs> and she's like, okay, so that's the sixth one. Um, now moving on to seven, and she, he's like, um, Rindo, stick out your tongue. <laughs> it's just, they're so great together. They're so goofy. Um, what I like is that they're not combative. The both of them understand the other one few, um, serves the purpose they need to serve. And whenever they have ideas, they're not combative in their ideas because they understand what they're talking about. Suguru knows what he's talking about when he does talk. Rindo knows what she's talking about when she talks. And they both acknowledge each other's knowledge. They acknowledge each other's goofiness as well and Suguru's over-the-top goofiness. She accepts it. They're, they're kind of accepting while not pushing back too much. And I think that creates a really nice chemistry. But I can go on forever. Um, the only, only negative um, that I have so far, and it's got me a little concerned. So, like I said... We've only had one mystery so far. The, the first episode was the opening, the meeting. The second episode, third and fourth episode was one mystery. I felt the first mystery sort of tipped its hand too early. I had a... Something stood out. And it felt like it was a little bit too obvious. And I got stuck on it. And then it ended up being what kind of becomes the actual resolve. And that sort of bugged me. Not to say those three episodes weren't great, because what it sort of showed me was, one, the chemistry, two, the directing, and three, Rindo's ability to sort of not accept maybe what I've seen, but rather get the full picture so that she can present it, because otherwise it would not have been accepted unless she explained it properly. And so that's the only reason I'm not, I don't hate it, because of that tipped hand. But I'll see with the next mystery. I'm curious if that's going to be a commonality. That they're going to be a little too obvious about who might be involved. So, but that's been, that's the only thing that I really didn't like about it. The rest of it's been fantastic. So, I definitely recommend Undead Murder First. So, there you go. Next, next. Are we actually going to, are we going to even finish part one of these? I don't think we're going to even finish part one segment. Uh, Malevolent Spirits Monogatari Part 2. Um... This one is, of course, part two of the two core series, uh, essentially following Hyoma, who is um, somebody that takes down Sukumogamis. Um, he starts off in the show really hating Sukumogami, wants to kill them all, um, but he's being trained under somebody that likes to seal them away rather than destroy them. He thinks they're super dangerous because his brother and sister, who were really great um, at what they did, end up getting killed by this paper umbrella, Sukumogami. Uh, Sukumagami, Sukumagami is basically being uh, almost like yokai. It's when a item is around for long enough, it can be possessed by a spirit, and then it embodies itself as, often cases, disguising itself as a human, um, but acts, sometimes having the characteristics of whatever they actually are. But yeah, there's this evil paper umbrella one that killed his, his family. And so he wants them all destroyed. Uh, but then he's forced by his master to live with Botan Nagatsuki, who is kind of this... Somebody who is very special, and I don't know if I, I don't remember exactly how early in the first part it got into it, but she's very, she's very special to both um, the eyes of the humans and the, the Tsukumogamis. And there's sort of this kind of desire for her to remain neutral, that neither side gets too involved with her. So obviously him being a human now living with her um, is going to upset some people. But she lives in this house alone with, um, was it six Tsukumogamis that take care of her and protect her? They're basically each Sukumagamis based on essentially a wedding set. Like traditionally back in the day, they used to have these big wedding sets that would be presented in a wedding. Um, so each one of them is kind of each individual item of that. But um, yeah, Hyoma is living with her, eventually learns that yes, you can trust Sukumagami because Botan 
lives with Sukumagami, and they can be trusted. Um, so he's learning to trust that there are good Sukumagamis, but at the same time, understanding there are evil Sukumagamis. Just like humans, there's good and bad. So, getting into the second season, we've pretty much, uh, surprisingly, um, actually, uh, seemingly addressed the paper uh, Sukumagami. Not that it's been resolved, but at least they've cut, they brought to the forefront. They also died a little bit more into Botan herself because she was, thankfully, something they got into pretty quickly uh, later in the first part, which I think is the refreshing thing about this because I think my my final thoughts on the first part was that at its heart, this is a shonen. It's a supernatural battling type of show where here's the next threat, take it down. Um, while at the same time having, here's the driving force of the main character, they hate this really powerful thing that they're probably not going to fight until the later, the very end of the the manga that's based off of. Um, the, obviously, the girl of the story is going to be special somehow. She's this thing that all humans and Sugumagami are after. Um, and obviously, Hilma has to protect her. But they're getting into stuff quick enough. I think my only issue I had with the first season is that at some point, it felt shonen in the idea that it's like, okay, now it's time for Hilma to get more stronger. Cue the the training montage. And additionally, I didn't like how every time there was an actual like moral or um, emotional conflict with Hyoma, like somebody thought that they might have upset him. Like he looks really upset and he walks away into the, the sunlight. It would always cut to when they run into him again. He's like, oh no, I had to go do this. Like I had to go take a pee. Like it always ends up turning into a joke that he looked like he was upset, but he wasn't actually upset. Um, and I and I felt like they over kind of played that, but getting to the, getting to the second part so far has been pretty solid. I've I've liked that they've like I said, technically jumped right into Hyoma's major driving force was the paper umbrella. They're getting more into Botan. They're really it really does feel like it's building up into something very quickly, and that's not something you typically run into with shonens. Typically, shonens drag that stuff out forever. Those those starting plot lines are for way later. Um, as to if they actually deliver on anything in this 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 second core, I don't know, but it feels like they're building into something, and it's it's got my it's got me excited. Um, the paper umbrella, if it is her, I don't even know if it is her. Um, the paper umbrella is super creepy, <laughs> like she is super creepy, um, and I can't wait to see more of her. So, yeah, that's my thoughts so far. It's 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 solid. The action and the animation's pretty darn solid. It's not I mean, it's not affordable, but it's it's doing really good. It's it's visually very pleasing. So. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Sweet Reincarnation, Okashi na Tensei. This one is being done by Synergy SP, uh, done based on a light novel, fantasy, gourmet, slice of life of the genres. And this one, if you did not guess, if you're watching this show and you do not know how this opens, you're crazy, because every episode tells you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. He is a pastry slash sweets chef. He was making this gigantic, it was like, I think it was made out of just sugar. It's like this big, like, sugar confection of a chicken. And um, he did not get hit by a truck. No, the chicken, this gigantic sugar chicken, fell on him during a competition. So he was a set guy by chicken. Um, so after being a set guy by chicken, he wakes up in another world. And he is the son of Casserole Mortalin. And Casserole Mortalin uh, has raises an obsession him. with casseroles. No, you would think so. Uh, and Casserole eventually births pastry Mortalin, which is our character that got killed by a chicken. Um, but yeah, go figure, the guy that's obsessed with making pastries and confections is named Pastry. But yeah, Pastry is, is raised up in this, this world. Uh, come to find out, Casserole Mortalin, his father, is like apparently a, a war hero. He is like been cultivating a land for like 20 years um he's had like four daughters and then a son which is pastry who's now nine years old and he looks like he's in his 20s so i don't know what the hell this dude's eating but he apparently has been a war hero um cultivated a land for several years and had many children in the time most take us entire lifetime to do i don't know maybe because he's a hero he maybe he just doesn't age but we'll see but yeah um pastry is you know it doesn't seem like he's too upset about being in this world. He's been helping out his father by giving him tips on how to, like, you know, spread stuff over the crops, helps him grow better. Um, his his father's obviously pretty shocked by how Pastry's coming up with all these great ideas that are helping them 
improve their stocks and you know craft things. But um, he just figures his son is a genius, um, a genius enough that while normally when you reach the age of fifteen, you do this like coming of age ceremony, which you go to the church and they put you through the ceremony. And they discover if you have the the ability for magic and the gods will bestow you with the magic. He has patriots do it at uh, patriots do it at nine. While bandits are on the way to the town, because apparently the father figured that it would be best to to have him go for that coming of age ceremony while bandits are coming towards his town, uh, teleports to the church, puts him to the, the ceremony, which has you locked up inside of a room and isolated for like and two he, days. Yeah, it, normally it's like a day, and he was in there for three days or something crazy like that. But yeah, he 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 was fine because he just sat there thinking about what he was going to make with the apples that he ate in the in the market. Um, but he, he ends up getting bestowed upon him the ability to replicate, um, which he later on uses to fight off the bandits by replicating a burn mark on somebody's face onto the bandit leader. Oh, and I, later thought, on I, he, I, I forgot about that. I, 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 I thought that you were going to say that he just uses it to make pictures. <laughs> yeah, he does that. Um, <laughs> he replicates his dad's teleport ability. He pretty much says that anything that he can count or he's had interactions with or observed, he can replicate. But he so, can't make sugar. That's what I haven't figured out yet. Because um, <laughs> he's like, he wants to make sweets, and he wants his dad to order a bunch of sweets, and he, he gets mad at him because he puts it on the on the receipts and stuff like that. But then he's like, oh, why, why don't you just replicate food? Like, I'm like, when are you going to do this? Um, but a lot of the focus early on is just that this land that he's living in is doesn't make anything that he can turn into sweets. He wants to make a land of sweets. His father is looking forward to the day that pastry will grow up to lead an army, but Pastry wants to lead a, a nation of sweets. Uh, there's obvious, there's other nations that want to foil them, so they're secretly sending bandits to take them out, and Pastry's helping his father foil them and stop the leaderships from sending more people, because he knows who, that it's them. Um, what was the recent episode? I forget what they kind of got into recently. Oh, he was just going around, essentially, yeah, making pictures for people, trying to set up uh, different basically being uh, a marriage counselor for people secretly by giving uh, young noble boys pictures of cute uh, noble girls that they can get wed with and then setting up marriages and then protecting them because apparently other nations wouldn't want them to get married. Yeah. I would say matchmaking service, but he's not really a matchmaker. He's just doing the pictures. Yeah, it was like it was like this conversation about trying to make money, and he's like, "Look, Dad, I can make pictures." And like, "Oh, let's do this." And like, "So, were they gonna make money from selling the?" I thought they were gonna sell the portraits, but then it like turns into a marriage. Yeah, it turns into like a whole like marriage thing, and that's again technically to the point of the story is marriage can often shift the tides of alliances and stuff for different families. Thoughts? Is he hasn't made a like he's made like one pie. Why is a sweet reincarnation? Well, and that, it feels that, like it's going nation building route, not necessarily it, it, cooking. And that's that's one of the things that I, it, it, it's this weird. I'm in this weird place. It feels like false show. advertisement, <laughs> and I'm not mad because I I'm hate not food stuff. It, it, it's like anytime he talks about food, it's kind of annoying because it's taken away from this really kind of cool story that they're building here. I really, um, I'm actually very shocked how much I've enjoyed. Um, how they're pulling this together. I, I, I'm very surprised. Like, uh, one of the greatest examples of this is, um, his town got attacked by some bandits. Um, at some point, and then he um, trains all the kids to chuck rocks at the bandits and kill them. <laughs> they're like, that's sounds dangerous. He's like, just do it. Okay. Kids are going to become murderers. <laughs> um, at some point, the, um, it's found out that, the reason the bandits were there was because of this countess or or viscount or whatever. I don't really care what her freaking role was, but or what her uh, title was. But they Brioche. found out her name was, is Broche. Um, Brioche. They found her out, and so they <laughs> went. So they went. Uh, him and his father went to kind of confront her. And then they go into this kind of uh, tidbit, uh, uh, tidbit of a tit for tat going back and forth and trying to um, take control of the 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 um, argument. And he she's really offset by the fact that she wasn't expecting the the boy to um, kind of do the negotiation. She was expecting the uh, the 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 father, and. 
it, it starts going into this him being really wi- actually witty in his ability to um, take control of the negotiation. And I, I there's a lot of things in here that is just wait, wait. I thought I was going to have some kind of obsessed um, uh, pastry nerd going into a new a new world, and we were going to get some kind of cool thing here, but it's really going to be focused around him doing his pastries. The only thing about sweets in that whole discussion, that whole scene, was the fact that they're known for their tea and their cookies. Yeah. And she's like, well, how do you like the cookies? Eh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> what kind of cookies do you eat? It, the, it, the the funny thing is is oddly enough I do kind of find him getting and I and and this is the frustrating thing I know that's his driving force is the sh- the the sweets but for some odd reason I actually find it really annoying whenever he brings up freaking sweets every because episode what has to be said one, one, not besides the intro, always telling the story of how he got killed by a chicken. <laughs> what does he say at least once every episode? I will make a land of sweets. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> He's going to make the land of sweets, by the way. I think he, one episode he does it like at least two times. Like, hey, I don't care anymore. And it is one of those things. It, it I find it really annoying. And, and, and I, and it's, it's kind of frustrating because I want to give the, the leeway to the fact that. Um, because he is technically a pastry chef and it, he was obsessed with pastries and now he's in another world. He's going to want, that is his drive. But at the same time, it, it's, it's kind of, it, I, it's almost like I think the, the, the writer had this cool idea and he wanted the pa- pastry chef and he was pr- he, he, planning on doing the pastry thing but somehow he ended up being a lot better of a writer than he realized and now he's kind of stuck with this pastry thing that he doesn't know what to do with (laughs) i have to i have to give credits dude if you if you've ever experienced being out of your particular craft for nine years dude is pretty darn good at cooking even after nine years of not cooking anything sweet like he just like whips together like an apple pie and it's like one he's not in his he's not in a modern environment like he's got like stoves and stuff that he has to like slip you know like open stove type of things and he's literally cooking a perfect apple pie after nine years i give the dude massive credit like it it, i've been out of i've been out of my line of work that i grew up learning for like five years and it was it's like i'm done like i can't even of course granted technology advances on a regular basis cooking kind of keeps pretty on point but anyways long story short i generally enjoy it with this slight annoyance of the pastry side (laughs) yeah that's the that's the troubling thing like i said jokes aside it's like this is literally like the biggest example of a false advertisement because like my fear coming in this show was that this was going to be pretty much two things that I don't necessarily like in anime. I don't like shows about foodies. Like, I don't like foodie shows. I don't like the, oh, it's so delicious. You know, he cooks something and feeds it to five people and they all go, oh, it's so delicious. I just hate those shows. I, it, I, I, I watched Yakutate Japan way back here. I even tried to do Food Wars, which is basically a copy of Yakutate Japan. Um, I got it out of my system. I'm tired of watching these type of shows. It just, it, the constant here, eat this. Oh my gosh, it's super delicious. Clothes rip off or whatever. Um, it's gotten old. So a show about food and an overpowered main character. Um, you have two bad tick marks on the show already. And it's so surprising jumping into it. I'm like, this is not really about really either of those. Like he's not, yes, he's overpowered when this situation comes, but he's really using his smarts. Like he's using his, his growing up in this environment. His father is the Lord of this land. And people respect his father because he's a war hero. And he helped them basically cultivate this land. People followed his father to this land to cultivate it and make it flourish. And so people really respect his father. And in, re- in regards, because he's using his smarts to help his father and assist his father, people respect pastry too, even though he's only nine, nine years old. Um, and it shows. Like, he even has these two kids that look up to him like they're his generals. Um, it's got this nice little setup that he is technically following his father's footsteps. Again, the joke is that his father wants him to lead a war or an army, whereas Pastry just wants to make a land of sweets. Um, In case you didn't know, he wants to make a land of sweets. And it's, so it's kind of 
my initial impression was it's going to be about him making sweets in this other world and everybody being like, oh my gosh, it's delicious because we're in a, you know, not a developed world. But it's turning into what I think is possibly a nation building show. Um, something akin to something like the thing that always jumps to my mind is um, prodigies have it easy in another world too. This idea this this class of prodigies gets transported to this other world. I think they were on a plane or something like that. And they get transported into another world. And what they do is they see that this other nation is kind of being nasty to the nation they're kind of next to, or this village. And so they're trying to help them develop. So they're giving the knowledge that they have being prodigies from our modern times to advance this world, to rise up against the other kingdoms. And I feel like that might be what they're doing here. Pastry wants to make sweets. So he's helping them by protecting them, helping his father gain allies and protecting his land so that he can create a safe haven so that he can then build a land of sweets. So that's what I think it's going to turn into is what makes money is goods and services. Can he protect the land, cultivate sweets, produce sweets, sell those to the nobles and everybody else, and thus bring in a bunch of money and thus create a land of sweets that he's looking for. That's where I think it's, that's where my assumption is that it's going. And if it can do that, it's a lot more interesting than what I initially thought it was going to be. It's not the most entertaining show. I find pastry to be kind of boring. Um, but it's at least got a pretty good balance of the characters constantly moving around and doing things that has kept my interest. And I am pretty curious where it goes. Visually, it's it moves. It's it's okay. Um, there's been a couple shots that were kind of a little bit blah, but for the most part, it's it's functioning. So I'm I'm fine visually wise. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a it's another mid mid middle of the road show. It's like in the it's in that five possibly pushing the six road um, for a show for me right now. So um, decent, and I'm interested to see where it goes from here. So that's a uh, sweet. Sweeto reincarnation. So. You want one more? I could do one more. I, I, I'm going to rant about this one for for a little while. Are you sure? That's why I'm saying one more. <laughs> <laughs> the heretical last boss queen from villainous to savior. Uh, or he did. Oh my gosh. Higeki no Genkyo to Naru Saikyo Gedo last boss jewel. Wa tame no tame ni. Um, oh, sorry. I, I there's another line. Uh, the second line, suku shimasu. It's <laughs> a long title. Uh, but yeah, this one um, opens up with uh, essentially the the villainous of an Atome game, which is Pride Royal Ivy. Uh, when she's very young, at some point she suddenly recalls the memory of her previous life. Yes, she is an isekai. That is transported into an Atome game and has come to realize that she is now Pride Royal Ivy. Of all the people in this game that she could isekai into, the villainous. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, it's like the fact that she's kind of shocked by that. And I'm like, if I got isekai as the villainous, I, I think I'd be like, yeah, that's, that's natural. I'm I mean, going somewhere else. We're, we're, I'm we're, running far, we're, far away. <laughs> who else? Take as much money as I can and get the heck out of town. It would be a really shock to be... In I mean, we had the Atome <laughs> game one, which uh, the Atome game is tougher mobs, but it's been the only case where it's not been the the villainous. Um, but anyways, yeah, she she realized this and then is just quickly distraught by it. Um, obviously, everybody's kind of panicking because Pride Royal Ivy is, is shocked and not looking too good. But yeah, um, she knows who Pride Royal Ivy is. She played the game. Um, she knows that Pride is extremely evil. Essentially, over the course of the story, will do horrible t things to each and every single one of the male love interests, um, including, like, with Stale, um, she essentially... He, Stale becomes in as the... Um, pretty much the decreed brother of the family, and then she has him sign a contract claiming that he'll let her go back... Claiming that he can go back to see his mother if he signs it, um, but essentially just gives, him, gives her full authority that she can give him any command he has to follow it. In which time she commands him to go kill his mother. Just because she wanted to see if he'd do it. That's how cruel she is. But she does terrible things to each and every single one of the male love interests. Eventually the female um, main character, which is actually her sister in the story, uh, will eventually come to light. She will take in all of the broken male leads, win them over, 
and eventually go after take down pride because as pride ascends the throne she eventually caused the destruction of her kingdom so yeah she obviously knows this is not a good route and so she's um trying to not do any of that <laughs> uh very quickly she uh realizes that her father after seeing her will go off and get an accident she calls out to him to stop which then triggers the premonition gift that essentially whoever in royalty they kind of include it could be really anybody um the person that is bestowed upon them the ability to see the future premonitions uh, will then take the throne next her mother had it so now her telling them that her father's going to die, not because she had a premonition, because she knows the story. Um, because she knew that something bad was going to happen to him, um, that was her awakening that. So she's going to be next in line for the throne. Um, they introduced her to her brother, Stale. Eventually, she gets involved with trying to save um, this group of soldiers that were involved in an incident, and uh, meets her sister. And um, so far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. It seems... This is going to get into my thoughts on the show itself. It seems to imply, um, with the emphasis in every episode about how it sort of plays out what the villainous of the story does to each one of these individuals as she's introduced. When she's first introduced to Stale, which again is her new brother by decree, when she first meets Stale, it plays out what happens, which again was that whole contract and her forcing him to kill his uh, mother. But then again, she doesn't do that. She actually welcomes Stale into her family. Even tries to give him the ability to run away. Like, gives him the keys to unlock his cuffs so that he can go see his mom. But then eventually talks to her father into allowing Stale to be able to talk to his mother on a regular basis and continue to send his mother money because normally when they take somebody into the royal family, they'll just take the the, the child from the mother, give her a one, one little lump sum, and then they'll never see their child again. But she, through talking to her father gets them to regularly send the mother money so that she's taken care of and allowing them to communicate, um, which is a huge deal to him. She also tells Stale, after pretty much winning him over, um, that if she ever shows any sign, she's pretty much been telling everybody this, if I show any sign of becoming an evil person, kill me. And they're all shocked by this because this pride is great. She's so sweet. She's done everything to try to help me out. Nothing about her is evil. Why is she telling me they? she wants me to kill her if she goes? She does something terrible? Um, and that's how they've kind of been playing it out. What I'm getting a feeling they're sort of implying here is that Pride is experiencing this because she's obviously played it, uh, played the story, but she's experiencing what she's supposed to do, but she's not doing it. She's doing right for everybody. She's trying to protect everybody. She's feeling the emotions of essentially regret and grief for what the true pride would do to these people while she's trying not to do those things. So it's almost as if she's emotional about what these people are put through by her, even though she hasn't done any of it. So it is sort of trying to insinuate that she's sort of being manipulated in a way or haunted by her true self, even though she is an isekai into this body, um, which is sort of interesting. So, Thoughts? I think this show is brilliant. I it, One of the things that um, kind of has come out of this... I, 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 all of the Ot Otomi games that we've, we've, we've gone through so far, each one has had their own little... Th quirk that they've done in particular in this one i did not realize how much just digging into the villainous and her kind of sins per se um how much that would have affect the story as a whole and i've really enjoyed this um this kind of drama these drama moments that they're actually playing out the uh, like Andrew had said, uh, going into Stale and and how brutal uh, Pride was with Stale and actually getting some kind of a resolve, it actually played out really well where I I really felt fantastic. Um, not fantastic. Oh my gosh. You're um, <laughs> I was so happy seeing how terrible <laughs> he was to her. Um, 
I mean, having him kill his mom? That was fantastic. Oh, I, I really did enjoy the kind of um, resolution to this storyline of her actually kind of breaking through these these issues of what was there, how she kind of sidestepped the, the storyline and kind of really resolved it and really kind of brought stale all the way around in a loop and actually made in effect uh became uh made him into a love interest for her um now what how that all plays out later on i i'm sure it's going to be really fantastic i really really like the writing in this this uh show um from each one of the side characters they they seem to a lot of these stories are real real heavy in a lot of cases and I really love how um, they are tying into the main story and how it's playing into this Atomi game and still at the same time continuing and, and making each story fresh so far. So I'm really liking it. Um, I, yeah, I highly suggest it. I really, really am loving it. That was it? I thought you were going to go for another 20 minutes. I know, right? I I, I don't miss this show. I, I, I've got it on practically a schedule i really love the show i am of two minds there, there's a side of me that's like if what i think it's doing it delivers it's genius but i don't know necessarily that it's what it's doing it, at its core if if the concept of what i'm what i'm assuming it's doing and if it nails this i think it's going to be genius what i think it's doing is having her being haunted by the real pride but it hasn't really said that yet. This is kind of one of those ones where I'm almost tempted just to crack open the novels and see if it's just not being portrayed properly enough. Because so far what we're getting is just spending too much time telling the story that wasn't that she's not doing. And I think that's where narratively I'm not liking this show. Is that it spends too much of its time saying what she should be doing or what the bad pride did. But we're not doing that. So stop telling me what she's not doing and tell me the story of what she's going to do. Too much of the show is spent going, this is what Pride did to Stale. This is what Pride did to this guy. This is what Pride did to this character. I don't care because she's not doing that. Tell me what Pride as this isekai is going to do instead. I don't need to spend this much time to tell me what she's going to do. Unless, like I said, and if they deliver on this, and again, I don't think they're necessarily nailing this in the way they're portraying it. Unless she's haunted by this stuff. She's indicated well, that she's haunted by this stuff. She grieves. She she cries in Stale's arm because of what the terrible things Pride did to her. But she has not done anything to Stale. So that's my issue is I don't know if it's just not portraying it well enough or it's just, it's, I don't know. It's just. Have you caught that it seems like the uh, love interests are having dreams of the evil Pride? It is indicated Stale did. It indicated that Stell did. He's like, what What was that? It wasn't... That was about the only character that's done it, though. Okay, so you did... And there wasn't one for uh, for the other one yet? No, because they literally just won him over. But I, that, I, maybe I missed it. That's but. true. Hey, maybe maybe it's because they haven't... Um, he hasn't woken up And they up haven't had Ivy yeah. really... Or uh, Tiara really reveal anything, so... But no, it's... Um, so like I said, the the big selling point early on was that the moment that she realized, oh, that's right, this is the point in which father leaves and then he gets in a carriage accident, she calls out to him and then she nearly falls out the window and somebody, a servant, grabs her and pulls her back into the, the room. And then all the maids panic. They're like, please don't kill him for touching you. He literally grabbed her to save her from falling out of the window. But they're afraid because they touched her they'll kill him because she's always been terrible. She has literally before she even awoken as I'm an Isekai, she before then, as Pride, has caused the death of many maids and servants because she just has them executed. She just finds fun in it. Oh, you did something wrong. Dead. So the moment that she even looks like she's a little distraught, everybody panics. Like, oh, we're, like at some point she realizes like, oh, that's crap. That's right. This is the point in the story that this happens. She has this like look on her face like she just realized something incredible. And then all the maids nearby are going, holy crap, what's wrong? What is she going to do next? Um, and she realizes this and starts to cry. 
I'm so sorry. She starts apologizing to everybody. I'm so sorry. Because, again, she's she's getting the emotions of regret and grief of pride in what she does. Again, I don't know that if that's what it's doing, that it's properly telling it, but it's giving me the indication this could be a really cool story if the concept here is that the sec-eyed pride is feeling grief and fear and turmoil over the other pride. And if at some point they'll have that moment where the real pride comes in and says, stop messing with my route. Do this. You're supposed to do this. Or would it be, in case of like Quistale, him seeing those visions, maybe he's like, no, this isn't pride. What are you talking about? This can't be her. This dream is not right. And it messes with them. I don't know that that would be anything that would make sense, but it does feed into the idea of what pride tells everybody. If I do something wrong, kill me. Um, it just feels like it has this undertone that could be really mind-bending for the main character. But so far, it doesn't seem like it's going to execute on that. Like, it, the possibility is what makes me think this show is great. But I don't know that it's actually going to deliver. Um, I love the episode where she goes out and um, gets all crazy and wrecks a bunch of bad guys. That was that was great. Um, and then immediately gets embarrassed because she, she yeah. <laughs> ripped her skirt. She's like, I'm like 11 years old. Why am I panicking like everybody's looking at my body? Um, it just has a little aspect of her like being a little conservative, I, even though I she's not supposed she to. I think she is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, I, yeah, like I mean, that was the initial draw. When we first knew this would be an adaptation, an adaptation for this, we were like, what, what would they say? It's mine. It's like it my, looks like a redheaded like mine. mine. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, it kind of plays in that same aspect. Granted, mine is a completely different character, but um, it kind of plays in that similarly. Um, I just really do. I just really like female-led isekais. I think they're really fantastic, and they just add a, just a way different flavor than most other shows. Um, I love her relationship so far with Stale. Uh, love her relationship with Tiara. They're doing a really, really great job with her introductions to each character. I just think as the story goes along with each of the characters, I think that's where it starts to sort of muddy up a little bit. Like this recent episode, they just... I liked the scene in the throne room, and the commander and everybody sort of mainly the commander, telling her off for what she did. Um, but at the same time, it felt like, even though I liked the scene and how it played out, it just felt like a little bit too long. So I don't know. Like Again, like, I think my overall thoughts of the show is that I, I love it. I love Pride. I love the concept they're presenting. I just don't know if it's nailing it. Like It, it just feels like something's not being told right. I don't, I don't know. I, it, I, just, I, 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 I kind of don't disagree or I kind of don't agree. Um, I, 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 you can make the argument of that particular scene being feeling a little bit long, but I think it was all kind of necessary. Um, it kind of plays I, into the theatrics that she does with each of the characters. Yeah. I gonna, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to protect the people. And it's like, I, I get this by this point. Do we really need to have the theatrics for every single character? Yeah, but it, I mean, when you stop and think about it, what would you cut? I mean, the soldiers uh, standing by what uh, her argument against the the commander. I mean, it it it's it, one of those things that he, when you stop and think back on it, I mean, uh, the way how it would change you... it would be that the the moment that she got them all out there and they were all celebrating that she saved their lives on the battlefield, he could have just addressed it then, and then we move on. And well, the gonna... point was that the, it, it was in a uh, enclosed area where nobody else could uh, it intervene was all and, and all that stuff. It was the same people, though. I mean, the only the only different thing there would be that probably the guy that had the ability to... They wanted to get her to safety because she was the princess, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, <laughs> she literally just wrecked everybody. So she didn't get her to safety. Um, yeah, that, 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 it, that's what the point to them not wanting her harmed, obviously. Yeah, it's... It, it, I, I mean... I guess I I disagree. I mean, they had a whole I, segment of her complaining about showing her leg, but that was fine showing that whole scene. You were making the <laughs> argument that they had to get her out of there, but they had plenty of stuff there anyways. I I mean, I guess I I I'm, I I I just disagree. I I think that it was there's nothing really in that. There's scene nothing that you said can't... wrong in the scene. It just felt like it went a little bit too long. It was too much theatrics, I guess. It felt like too much theatrics. Mm. I, I I think it was an excellent scene. I really liked it. I it it felt like a him challenging her and then her kind of asserting her her opinions on the situation. And I think that 
she really needed to do that. I, it was really a fantastic scene all around. And, um, even, even her in her mind going, uh, I was supposed to wait because this was, uh, an, an open forum for them to say what they needed to say without me challenging them. And, I, and, but she needed to challenge him. And I, I, I think it was a fantastic scene all around. Um, well, she was making the point that she wasn't supposed to, um, tell him she wasn't supposed to get onto him for, to, for speaking his mind, but she did. Right. That's really what she's saying. And that, and and I I think it was all around a very fantastic scene, um. But yeah, I I I don't know that I could really necessarily. I I. All, my whole point over, is that it's not necessarily about the scene itself. It's more the fact that it just feels like it's going. Here's the next male interest. This is the terrible things I did the male interest. Here's how I don't do terrible things the male interest. And here's how I win them over. Next character. Here's how terrible I do this male interest. Here's how I don't do what's terrible to the male interest, and here's how I win them over. Dude, that's what I'm saying is it's overall I'm seeing a a formula, and I don't know necessarily that's in the end going to be promising. Because what's the next female character? Is it the, the blue hair character? No, that's that's the the bad guy. I'm assuming it's either the um the the thief or the other guy, but I don't know who the fourth uh I mean I guess it might be that one, but I I'm I'm getting mixed signals on that that guy. So I guy? I don't yeah. yeah he's just the bad guy that Ivy does knows that yeah. he's basically trying to. Well, there's a, a blue hair guy in. They're the, the they're the long living advisor guy that doesn't like pride or something. I don't know. I don't know. It, it seems like maybe he he's in there. But I do know that the thief they caught the thief. So maybe the thief is probably the next one. Um, but all in all, I mean, I. As far as the formula, I I mean, I like the formula. I think the formula is doing really good. It 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 lays out the 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 storyline. It keep it incorporates it in an action, and it actually does do some. It, it's paying off for me. I think it's really doing those really well. That's the most heretical last boss queen from villainous to savior. Look forward to that one. I lied. I'm doing Dreaming Realist. I just want to get off my chest so I don't have to do it later. The Dreaming Boy is a realist. You didn't watch this, right? Yes, I did. You did? Oh, I want to hear your thoughts then. Um, Studio Gokomi is working on it. Nexus, light novels, the source, comedy, romance. Follows a guy named Wataru so Sajo, and he's obsessed with this girl, Aika Nak uh, Natsukawa. Always been obsessed with her, constantly pursuing her. Um, she basically thinks he's a stalker, constantly says stop following around. Eventually, a soccer ball nearly hits him right in the face. Doesn't really hit him in the face. Kind of goes flies by him. And then she turns and says, are you all right? And he's like, yeah, I'm good. And she's like, okay, well, stop doing that. This is why you should stop following me because you're going to get hurt. And he's like, oh, yeah, I probably should. And suddenly he decides at that point, after the soccer ball flies by, I'm just, just not going to pursue her anymore. Uh, instead, I'm going to stand on the sidelines and support her and root for her and be like a cheerleader for her. And over time... You know, everybody's kind of going, why the hell? What you, what's wrong with you, Wataru? You're not going after her again? Did you, what's wrong with her? Are you sick? I'm surprised they didn't call. <laughs> I, I, Yeah, I, I was half surprised that they didn't call, like, the Looney Bin folks to come get him. Because, obviously, this is world in changing. And we <laughs> I mean, need to fix this problem. I made a joke on my video. I'm like, I, I, I feel like it jumps straight into the fact that he gives up on her, like, right at the, right at the very beginning. That it's like, I don't know that I get a sense that he liked her. But then you find out through everybody else that he's obsessed with her. Because everybody will tell you on a regular basis that he spends his waking every waking moment pursuing her, and now he's not doing it. Um, so you will not go two minutes without somebody mentioning, hey, Wataru, why aren't you after Aika? <laughs> but yeah, over time, uh, Kay, they're good friends, constantly trying to figure out what's happening. Uh, eventually, this girl that's from a nearby class suddenly starts hanging out with him. Uh, apparently, her boyfriend, which is now her ex-boyfriend, apparently at some point claimed that he liked Aika. And so she broke up with him, and now she's hanging out with Wataru for some reason. Uh, he eventually kind of lets her know that, you know, that boys talk about how they like other girls all the time. Don't think any of it. She goes back to her boyfriend, um, resolves that situation. At some point, he nearly bumps into this girl that's part of the disciplinary committee, and she freaks out and runs away. And then her senpai confronts him at some point and says, oh, you're the one that bumped into my kohai. Um, I don't know how she knows that. Um, drags him into a room and then says, hey... Uh, what do you think about my the, the issues that my co-highs are having where they have no self-confidence? Because, um, you know, you ask random boys about uh, personal problems that your co-highs are having um, to help him resolve that issue. 
And then at some point, uh, while everybody's asking why he's not chasing after Ike anymore, uh, one of the student, the student council president, which is his sister, one of her assistants confronts Wataru to say, hey, something wrong with your sister. Um, I think she thinks that you, she insulted you too many times that you gave up on your dreams of something. So you should go talk to her because something's wrong with her. And so they set up a meeting with him and his big sister on the roof. And he tells her to be and, mean to her, him again. And he goes up to the roof and confronts her. <laughs> and she says something, effect, or he basically is like, you know, hey, uh, say 10 nice things about me. And she stumbles and never says a thing. And she says, well, they'll say 10 normal things about me. And then she says like a million things. Um, and from that conversation, I really guess get the idea that she felt like he, she thinks that she's at fault for him giving up on Ika. And she knows somebody, somebody that gave up on her dream too. And definitely not her. And so she apologizes for basically ragging on him all the time because she feels like she broke his self-esteem and that he gave up on his dream of going after Ika and that she'll stop being mean to him. And he's like, will you, will you knock it off? Um, you're always going to be terrible to me. Keep being terrible to me. To me. Um, shut up and let's move on with our lives. And so uh, Ika jumps out of nowhere. Apparently she's been stalking Wataru. He doesn't know why she was there, but obviously Ika was concerned about him. And yeah. Thoughts. I am so curious to know what your thoughts are on this wonderful show. <laughs> oh, at some point, Aika had a party at her house, but then Wathoro didn't show up because Wathoro has given up on her. Um, and they, they brought a different boy. And then she was super sad the whole time. And it's, her sister's cute. She's adorable. Um, she must be protected. First off, I want to like this show. I really, 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 really want to like this show. Yeah, Second Aika, off, Aika does the I have to pee wiggle. What? The I, I could wig, pee wiggle. It was in the PV where they were talking about her and she does a little jiggle thing. It looks like she has to go pee. Okay. That's cute. Um, <laughs> like that's all the second. That's like you put the whole budget in that wiggle. I'm sorry. <laughs> second. I do kind of like it. I am frustrated with it. I, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I, I do like the kind of fix a girl a week. It it kind of is, works kind of okay for this. Um, but all honesty, I find a lot of the, the storyline, I'm, I'm constantly feeling like I'm just dragging through to something. Give me something that I will enjoy myself watching. It's, it's, it's just flat out boring. I, I don't, I'm not enjoying it as much as I want to. I do like it. I like the characters. I like the storylines, some of the things that they're doing, some of the fix, the girl fixes I like, but all in all, I just find it boring. I think this is going to be prime candidate for the bad adaptation of the season. I, I really do from the whispers that I've been getting, this story is actually really supposed to be in depth, Wataru um, character 101. Um, from what I understand, this story is about somebody losing all self confidence. But unfortunately, because it feels like these stories are kind of being, I wouldn't say fast forward through, it's not like they're speeding through dialogue or anything. It just feels like segments are cut. Like, you know, it, this is one of those shows where as I'm watching, I feel like chapters are missing. That's like Rina. This girl, who is literally like the idol of the nearby classroom, has a really hot boyfriend in a higher uh, grade, and she just randomly shows up. Like, he just gave up on Ika, and then randomly this Rena girl shows up in the room, and everybody's freaking out that she's in the room. And she's just hanging out with Wataru. And then they start talking about why, what his problem is with Ika. She's talking about her problem with her boyfriend, and eventually he helps her kind of, by kind of pointing out that, yeah, this, this, this guy, I think he still likes you. And then she goes back and she's happy. And then, like I said, with the whole thing with uh, the student council or the student, uh, the correction committee or whatever, um, this discipline committee, it, it's like she randomly she came into the room and then starts talking about how her kohai has self-confident issues and that what she should do to fix it. And it's like, why are we talk? Why are you talking to this guy? Like, why him? Like, what is Wataru? What doesn't make any sense? 
Um, it kind of turns this whole thing where she wants to apologize to him. That makes sense. But other than that, just it, it doesn't feel right. Like the writing doesn't. And again, with the sister, this was the this was the tipping point for me. The sister's arc was like the 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 point which I realized something's missing in this adaptation, because literally the only interactions in the show that we have with the big sister is that she has him. She forces him to take a bunch of stuff from her room with her to school because she can't carry all the stuff. And so she forces him to carry it with him. Um, and then we have the scene where she texts him to say, come to the student council room. He comes there and she forces him to essentially help them with a bunch of accounting stuff. And everybody's like saying, yeah, your sister was right. You're really good at these presentations and stuff. They're all praising him. And then we cut to the rooftop where she literally says, I'm sorry for being demeaning you all the time and ruining your self-confidence and making you give up on your dreams. I'm sorry for being mean to you. And then he turns and says, shut up, will you? You're not like this. This isn't you. You're going to continue to be a terrible person to me, pretty much. And it's like, but, but so what this all sort of implies is that his sister has been essentially destroying his self-confidence. And then as, I, like I said, I, I've heard some chirps here and there because I'm trying to figure out what I'm missing here. This doesn't make any sense what they're doing with this. From what I understand... His sister and his mother has treating him has treated him terribly for a long time. Like terrible. That's why he lashes back at her so badly. You've always been terrible to me. You're always gonna be terrible to me. But additionally, what the story is a what I'm understanding is supposed to be about is somebody who's lost all self-confidence. He's given up on the girl of his dreams. And it's it's supposed to be a character study about that. Somebody has that just has been ragged on for so long. The girl of my dream has always rejected me and said I'm a stalker. Now she's happier. I mean, I'm no longer at her side, so people are actually confronting her. She has, like, five people around her talking to her after class. These are people that normally wouldn't confront her because they're all afraid of me being in the way. She's meeting people. She's got opportunities. This seems like it should be a pretty deep story about a character being kind of broken. But I don't think it's telling that story. Unless I'm reading wrong and people are lying... It makes sense that that's what they're going for because I sort of see signs of that, but this is not being told right. Yeah, it at all. actually does make a lot more sense in in that context. I mean, the soccer ball apparently is supposed to be a trigger point. Like, it is. This is a thing that makes him finally go, "Wait, oh, examine what I'm doing right now. I'm not good enough for her." And and that and that that a lot of that makes a million times more sense if if you take it from the the aspect of. But at the same time, it doesn't make much sense on the aspect of why everybody is looking to him as some kind of weird guru. Right. And that was my main concern was like, is that another aspect of the adaptation? Because it feels like this dude has confidence. Yeah. This is somebody that's talking to a, a hot uh, student council uh, disciplinary group. Uh, he's, he's, he's in that room talking to them without a fear and full confidence in himself. He's literally saying the thing that nobody wants to say to these people's faces. Well, he doesn't have a problem with self-confidence. He's talking to the cutest girl of a nearby classroom. The the literally the, their level grades, uh, their age group or um, school level, their idol, and he's well not the, shy the, at all. The funny thing is, is when I was um, but but there's well, a the difference in confidence and fear. Confidence could be in the idea that he's not afraid of talking well, to people, but he think. But he knows limits because he's not good enough. He's confident in talking, but he's not confident in relationships. It could be. Considering a lot of the ways that um, his communication, I, I was seeing him as more of a um, uh, almost like like the dialogue felt more like a, um, a snafuish character. Like somebody who's just cynical, but... I agree. Lost he, hope. Yeah, like a lost hope type person. But at the same time, you're right. It doesn't feel like he he fits in that snarky personality. However, if he was more a he beat doesn't down, have filters for sure. It yeah, seems like he doesn't he have was, filters. If he was beat down, if he sh if they kind of played up the him being more beat down, it would make more sense when the the soccer ball goes in front of him and that because it i i did catch that it seems the, like it went, a, it, yeah. it's pretty grandiose shot like it's yeah. like planets and stuff and yeah like, what <laughs> um but if that was it if that ended up being a trigger point and him kind of just hitting the rock bottom him being a more cynical um 
uh, sarcastic type person would um, trigger people to come to him for advice because th- well they, they sort of again this is kind of a realist, bad way of explaining realists are people that people go to for uh uh true kind of because you 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 want to go to the person who's going to be brutally honest not necessarily somebody who's going to fluff you up because a fluffy type person will tend to Yes, they they have their purpose as a somebody who can give you ex, a boost in confidence, but a realist is going to show you your your weaknesses. They're g- going to be the ones that are going to help better. So, in effect, if he is a kind of a realist type, snarky, cynic type character, and he it's not playing off that way. Obvious. We both agree on that. Yeah, I mean, the only indication um, that we got with Ren Shinomiya is that when he's walking up the stairs, he's basically pointing out that he's reading somebody. Like he's saying that somebody is seeing it this way, and she sort of says, "Oh, so you read it that way." It was indicating that she knew that based on him being, it, it indicated she knows that he's honest and that he's able to read people. Yeah, that was the only indication that I got that he would be able to help her with her problem. I mean, that's all she wanted. Somebody that's that's able to read people. Now, Yu Yu is kind of weird. Now, I understand <laughs> she's not weird. She's cute. No, I, she is adorable. <laughs> um, in a situation, t- uh, Yu is is kind of this. Her being afraid of him as a man phobia, and then but but being able to kind of. The dialogue in that one does not fit in the core of this other other side that we're seeing of it, 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 what you're talking about with uh, uh, Wataru being kind of a more cynic. Um, how, however, his the resolution does fit. Well, I think he's because not, well, he's him cynic. I think him he's pointing out, yeah, him pointing out that it's kind of frustrating that she uh, what. That she sold herself short basically by apologizing for this when she should have uh, uh, dealt with this or something like that. It was theatrics. Yeah. She was apologizing for the sake of it rather than for the reason of it or something like yeah. that. It was – and yeah, I I understood that. But it was just – it it felt weird because it was like one of those moments where she's like, wait, you're not telling me the whole truth. And he's like, well, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'll yeah. tell you the full truth. <laughs> she wasn't apologizing to you. He was She was apologizing for this. And it's like – this just seems like a weird conversation. <laughs> this just feels like a very weird conversation for a bunch of kids in school to be well, having. It, and and that one that that one never set right. And I now if well, he it's just was, like the sisters' argument it doesn't set well, right. It, well, and and it, but it all makes more sense. Um, I don't know that I like the idea of him telling her to. I mean, if she was honestly looking for some kind of a redemption, um, telling her go back to your old ways it's just absolutely well and asinine. here's a weird thing because it's like it that felt like a very cruel scene but in the context of what people are saying where that she was tormenting him along with her mother for a long time it's like now that makes sense that he would be so off putting in his reply to her like he seems like a jerk when he replies to it it's like again based on the anime i don't i don't see that his sister's mean just be other than the fact that she's having him help her yeah Forcing her to help him with a bunch of stuff. He didn't have to go to that room. He helped her. So I didn't see her doing anything terrible. But in the context that, yes, she's been term- uh, tormenting him for a long time, now it makes sense why he lashes back at her. Before, I thought he's just a, a prick in response to the whole thing. Um, but, you know, I, I would probably correct it in the idea that I don't necessarily think that he has... The the comment that people made was self-confidence. Like he's, he's lost. But that doesn't make sense to him being able to talk to so many people with such confidence. I think it's probably a, a, a self-confidence in relationships. It's probably going to come down to he just – he's broken when it comes to his confidence that he'll ever be good enough for other people. But I think he's perfectly fine talking to other people. So maybe that's the that's the disconnect there. But I don't know. It, it is it's kind of one of those ones where I don't think this is even out in English yet for the light novel. But it would be curious to kind of look into this more because it just seems like there's – if what I'm hearing is right, it does seem like there's an underlining story here that could be really good. Um, and if that's what this is doing, if that's what it, the light, light novel does, this adaptation sucks because <laughs> I'm not getting into this. Even getting into the next episode after the whole thing with the sister, like I started the next episode and I'm like, it just, the the, the, the dialogue and where the story is going makes no sense. Like, I just, I don't get it. Um, it's frustrating. 
in the end. But Ika is, I want to kind of watch it for Ika because she's, she's cute soon today, but it is one of those things of like every two seconds she's asking why Otto is not coming over to talk to her. And it's like, there's got to be something else missing in the story because this seems really stupid. <laughs> it's like, you should stop following because you're going to get hurt. Okay. Next scene. Wait, Watari, why aren't you coming over here? You just told him to not yeah. come to you. I understand Sudete, but it was seriously that quick? <laughs> like every time he comes in the classroom, you're not gonna come over and talk to me? Girl! <laughs> well, and that that's just like uh her her being upset that he didn't show up. Why why <laughs> didn't come to my party? Did, did she did she turn around? Did I miss a she scene? Invited. She, she did invited. invite him. Yes. Okay. She did invite. Because I did. I totally missed that. I was like, <laughs> when did she invite him to the freaking party? I No, but it's like, it is one of those things where it is kind of troubling. Because like, it, when they show him about how desperate he was to get to Aika and how she constantly was rejecting him. Um, this has been going on for a long time. And it's like, finally he gives up and everybody's like trying to push him. Why aren't you going to get... Why aren't you still after Aika? Why aren't you still after... Dude, that's like the most unhealthy relationship ever that he's been <laughs> spending so long following her around and she keeps saying he's a stalker. Leave me alone. You're bothering me. That's their... That's their relationship up until now. It's and her she's saying, like, leave me it's alone. It's so bad. It's so bad. She's got Stockholm Syndrome. She is like literally freaking well, I'm, codependent I'm, on him now. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> for her. But I'm putting her aside. Why does everybody want him to continue this? This is extremely unhealthy. He's. It's good that he's moving on, people. Let him be. Uh, it is so It is so bizarre. Um, it, that's, that's a funny thing because like I want to come into this gush going, it's a dumb, it's a goofy rom-com sundere but it feels like there's something serious underneath it that you're supposed to take serious uh it's bizarre so it doesn't look great that's my other problem there is a lot of off modeling um which sucks because the pv looked really good if i'm right like the pv looked really good they just got all the perfect shots for that pv um it's not, not visually a great looking show i just want it to be better I, I really, really, <laughs> I find it boring. Son, come in here. <laughs> I raised you to be a man. The dreaming boy, I really Are you listening to me? I'm I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm just disappointed. I just want you <laughs> to do better. Before I leave this mortal coil, I just want you to be better, boy. <laughs> be better anyways that's uh that's it for this one we, we managed to get through a third of it um but yeah that's a uh, dream boy he's a realist check that out if you want but uh that's it that's uh, that's it for this this podcast episode hope you guys enjoyed these first impressions again as always we're at talkspear.com that's where all of our links are social media links ways to get to support us ways to patreon uh tips links if you're on youtube we have memberships and super chats Greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel. It means so much to us. And uh, yeah, make sure to go to the Discord and join that great community of people over there and talk about... I don't know if we have a channel for Dreaming Boy. If we do, I'm going to delete it. <laughs> we had we brought back Rent-A-Girlfriend's channel. And I'm like, why does this exist? <laughs> Nobody's talking in it because everybody's tired of talking about that show. Just delete the stupid thing. And I was like, we already had it for second season. So I just brought it back. It doesn't take up a channel slot. But why does this exist? <laughs> um, maybe I'll delete it. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's um, that's it for this this podcast episode. We hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, y'all take care. Oos.